Welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm joined by writer, director, filmmaker Richard Stanley. How you doing? Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, sir. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Now, uh, first of all, you just mentioned this. Uh, you're in France. Can you tell us, like, uh, not where exactly so we can go find you, but uh, whereabouts you are? I'm in the Pyrenees. In fact, I'm living in a place called Montsegur, which um, is a sort of Cathar enclave. It's the scene of a, um, a famous battle against um, Christianity in the 13th century when um, the heretics and the pagans basically got slaughtered by the crusaders. So, um, yeah, I've been living here about um, 10 years and um, doing what I can to um, revive the place's fortunes. That's pretty cool. Like, how did you, uh, how did you end up there? It was thanks to a documentary I made about a Nazi archaeologist named Otto Rahn and the SS archaeological department. Um, in the course of it, I actually visited the sites that they were talking about in the reports from the 1930s. And um, when I found Montsegur, I became aware that it was the closest thing to a, um, a, a supernatural um, horror movie or a horror novel in real life that I'd come across. And, um, you know, I figured, you know, who needs real life anyway? So I, I moved into the place. Oh, when you say, like, the closest you get to a real life uh, horror, what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, it's very similar to that Michael Mann movie, The Keep. Mm. I, I mean, basically, there's an ancient um, ruined citadel that um, made by um, hands unknown from um, that dates back into prehistory at some point. That's been a um, a site of various um, confrontations and massacres over the last um, two to three thousand years, and um, it, it continues to be to be active. Um, in the uh, in the outside world, um, it's much harder to um, believe in the existence of the, super, of the supernatural. But I've always been a Lovecraft fan, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, the place spoke to my heart. When you're in a place like that that has that history, uh, can you feel that, like in the atmosphere? Totally. And um, here, it feels like the past is continuously bleeding into the present. Um, the locals, the villagers in the street, seldom seem to have a conversation without the topic somehow drifting back to um, the 12th or the 13th century. It's amazing just walking down the road, overhearing the kind of normal conversations in bars and things. So, um, yeah, the, um, the presence of it is um, still very strong. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an excellent place for writing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the documentary. It's also one. Go on, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, it's also one of the only safe places in the world I've found for my books and um, DVDs. And that Mod Segur is genuinely um, secure and that at least nothing walks off the shelf here. <laughs> so you, you mentioned the documentary uh, Secret Glory about the uh, SS officer. And I, I, I actually have not seen it, but when I was looking up some stuff about you before the interview, and uh, I was looking at some stuff I didn't know about you, and uh, I found that, and I was like, wow, I, I really have to check this out. Can you tell us a little bit more about yeah, that? I've always, <laughs> yeah, I've always had a bad penchant for making documentaries about things nobody knows about. <laughs> um, I realize this is a mistake because as I've gotten older, I realize that most human beings want to know about things they already know. Uh, to have their um, everything they believe kind of re reasserted. Whereas I've always been drawn to stories that um, are completely um, off the radar. Mm -hmm. And in the case of um, Otto Rahn, he was a, um, a German-Jewish um, scholar who worked for the, um, the SS, who um, became obsessed with um, finding the Holy Grail. And of course, there's a whole debate as to what the hell a Grail might be to start off with. Mm -hmm. But um, thanks to him being a Nazi and also being a Jewish Nazi, um, Otto had almost disappeared completely from the historic record by the time I stumbled over him. For the first few years, I thought he was a, a hoax or some kind of rumor. And then the more I dug into it, the more I realized that something really had happened back in the, the 30s and 40s. And there's so much bullshit written about Nazi occultism, mm -hmm. uh, mostly thanks to Trevor Ravenscroft and the, the Spear of Destiny. And also um, a lot of neo-Nazi groups who have um, deliberately um, put an awful lot of false data out onto the net. 
that it seemed important to try and establish the facts about what really went on in the in the Arnenerba, in the um, the SS's um, folklore and supernatural department. Um, this was back in the 90s when there were still enough people alive for me to be able to interview them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I realized that um, history was passing beyond the point when there was anyone left in a command position to actually get any straight answers. And it seemed like an area that um, the conventional Reich historians had um, deliberately stayed away from. Mm-hmm. So who, who did you actually talk to? Well, we do- we couldn't find Otto. He turned out to be dead, mm-hmm. unfortunately. But we found um, twenty five other people, including his um, lover from um, the nineteen um, thirties, and um, his niece and his sister, and um, his former publisher, and um, a number of other folk who all spend their time in the documentary insisting they're not really Nazis, which is a um, a curious thing. I mean. Um, We're used to seeing grand old actors playing Nazi war criminals in different um, movies. Larry Olivier used to be very good at it. But um, running into real Nazis, um, pretending to be ordinary people, takes it to a a, a totally different level. Yeah. How did you, uh, how did you, how do you go back about finding those people? Crazily, when we were doing Secret Glory, we ended up looking in the telephone directory. (laughs) Okay. This was uh, my camera, my German cameraman's initiative. At one point, we were so frustrated, we simply looked up the names of um, Otto's um, best friends and lovers from the 1930s in the telephone book. And we looked in telephone books for, um, for Berlin, for Munich, and for Geneva. A lot turned out to be in Geneva. And then we cold called the, the names in the books, and we very rapidly found grandchildren and cousins and nephews and nieces of the people in the historic record. Mm-hmm. And then we were able to work through that to um, get back to the older generation. Mm-hmm. That's pretty wild. You said, you know, a lot, yeah. of, uh, a lot of the stuff with the Nazis and the occult is, like, um, exaggerated. But um, doing your research, how much of it is, like, based in fact? Um, a pretty small percentage. I mean, the, the the longer I looked into it, the clearer it became that the main Nazi leadership had no interest in the supernatural whatsoever. I mean, I, I find no evidence to suggest that Adolf Hitler um, ever um, entertained the idea of the supernatural actually existing. And in fact, is very disparaging about it a number of times. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Hitler and um, Goering and Goebbels were basically... Um, too pragmatic to um, believe in anything like that, or at least they didn't have time for it. Um, pretty much everything that went on happened under the aegis of um, Heinrich Himmler and Himmler's SS. Uh, and it's clear that on some level Himmler is um, batshit crazy in that um, he believes he's the reincarnation of Heinrich of Saxony and um, started to um, try to build this, um, the Black Order, the, the grail cult of the SS. And certainly within the SS, there we find um, yeah, genuine research going on into um, archaeology and into the supernatural. All of this within one division of the SS, who were um, eventually purged in about 1939. The entire um, division doing the research was um, closed down, and um, a lot of people jailed or um, disappeared, which I believe is because of a... Um, a battle between the Christian SS officers and the pagan Luciferian SS element. Mm-hmm. I think the um, the regular um, Christian German soldiers became frightened and dismayed by um, the way that um, so many um, Luciferian and um, extremely cranky people were being um, promoted above them inside the SS. Uh, who people who also had no um, history of um, of being soldiers or being in combat. I mean, Otto made it all the way to being a um, an Obersturmführer, um, despite um, being essentially um, gay and Jewish, and um, someone who absolutely um, yeah d- seems to have despised violence. Mm-hmm. And I think this um, ruffled the feathers of the career soldiers to the point where a um, a sort of like like Kenneth Starr going after Clinton, a um, cabal of um, SS officers under um, Karl Wolf, Himmler's personal adjutant, um, basically spent a number of years amassing data and evidence to bring down the um, the, the, the crazy ones. 
Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, some kind of um, internal standoff happened in 1939, which um, pretty much um, put an end to it all. Mm -hmm. Despite that Himmler's dreams of a black Camelot and building the huge order castle and the, the creation of the, the round table where he imagined his um, 12 Ubergruppenführers, his 12 Grail Knights would meet, in practice he only had time to take one meeting at the table. And the, um, the castle ended up being barely used. The dream seems to have, the very dark dream of um, Heinrich Himmler seems to have, yeah, withered and died, thankfully. Mm -hmm. You said that Otto was uh, a, was gay and Jewish. Uh, how, how did that work? <laughs> Not very well for Otto. No, well, yeah. I mean, I, I suspect, I mean, to what extent he was out, he was openly gay is hard to know, mm -hmm. because in the 1920s and 30s, I think people were so in the closet and so repressed that a lot of the time they couldn't even admit to themselves what their sexual orientation was. And Otto really feels like an alien, a bit like, um, he reminds me of a German H.P. Lovecraft, because he's just so out of touch with, um, with normal humanity that I'm not sure that he would even um, have, um, yeah, typified himself as gay. Mm -hmm. But um, he certainly failed to um, ever form any, um, yeah, meaningful relationships in his life. Mm -hmm. I saw a Q&A actually did uh, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the documentary, and uh, you mentioned in it that uh, you're no longer an atheist, that uh, the cha you change your beliefs. And um, like, what one point in time did that happen? It was a slow progression through working on the Otto Rahn story. Uh, it, took, it, it took over, uh, I'd say, about 17 years, 17, 20 years of um, being familiar with the story. I started off as a complete skeptic. And um, then the more I looked into the story, the more things I found that, um, yeah, were puzzling. And um, that then um, led me to go to the places. I think um, the best approach when dealing with um, the unknown is to try to um, go there for yourself and put yourself in harm's way and um, see whether um, it's true or not. So I started uh, making a lot of journeys to um, stone rings and um, ruined castles at certain times of the year, trying to get there for eclipses of the moon or um, the summer solstice or um, different periods. And um, slowly the... Um, the sensation that Otto was was right or was onto something kind of crept up on me over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, then, um, yeah, the, a level of coincidence, obviously. Mm -hmm. no, was, uh, a lot of the, the... Go on. I was just going to say, a lot of the freakiest shit in this world tends to revolve around over-the-top coincidences. Mm -hmm. did, did all that Points happen... When, yeah. Did all that yeah. happen? Well, did all that happen uh, before or after uh, the island of Doctor Moreau? Because you know, in the documentary, you talk about um, uh, witchcraft and warlocks, and um, so did you not believe in that? Like, uh, or is that uh, how does that work? I don't. Know. How can you believe in the witchcraft and warlocks if you didn't believe in uh, this stuff till, till then? Well, like most people, I think my rational mind has always been fighting a battle with um, the side of me that wants to believe. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my, I've, I've got a, a reasonable enough IQ that whenever something strange happens, um, five different explanations usually suggest themselves. And um, I've always, um, thanks to the, um, the reading, the, um, I've been a fan of um, supernatural horror and fiction since I was a child. Mm -hmm. and the genre, I'm, I'm, I know a fair amount about it. But um, at the same time, I'm, I'm well aware that um, there's a huge number of crazy people out there in the world who um, believe all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the, it took a long time for the, um, the rationalist, the skeptic in me to, um, to be budged. It literally, um, I had to go all the way to... Um, the key incident that turned me around was a um, an apparition that was seen by um, a bunch of us in 2007. And it, it had to go all the way to the point where I was seeing something with my with my actual naked eye, but at the same time there had to be other witnesses. Um, if I'd just seen it on my own, I would have um, rationalized it as being an LSD flashback or um, some kind of um, temporary bout of insanity. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm kind of such a 
a crazy rationalist that way around that I kind of um, need to have three different eyewitnesses and um, preferably a recording before I'm prepared to uh, <laughs> uh-huh. to cave in and accept that we may not honestly know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I kind of the same way. Uh, just uh, recently I had uh, my first experience with uh, Ouija boards with my uh, co-host on the show. She can't be here today, Annabelle. And... Uh, like uh, there was some, there was like a lot of weird stuff that happened with that, and uh, I still don't believe in it, but uh, it does make you think there was uh, maybe something to it. Do you have any experience? Yeah, I've got a very re- mm-hmm. I've got a very relaxed attitude towards Ouija. Um, had, had quite a lot of fun with it over the years. I've got a, um, <clears throat> a glow in the dark Ouija board which I picked up at a, <laughs> a Toys R Us in California. <laughs> Oddly enough, that's I'm what amazed we have. that. <laughs> I love that Toys R Us carry it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's good for crouching in cupboards and uh, <laughs> playing around with the planchette. So, yeah, um, had a lot of fun with it over the years. Um, the highlight of that being um, the Theatre Bazaar, the anthology movie that mm-hmm. um, came out in, um, in 2010. Because, yeah, it, it, on, um, yeah, this was a, an anthology done by a bunch of different, um, yeah, equally... Um, controversial directors mm-hmm. um, I did the first segment which is something called the mother of toads mm-hmm. but um, my segment of theater bazaar is totally narrated by a Ouija board mm-hmm. yeah, I, the I, whole I, thing yeah, happened because yeah, was I really dig that movie yeah no, the whole thing happened I mean it totally was the Ouija board's idea explain that what do you we're, mean by scr- that? we're screwing around to the Ouija board and I asked the the, 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 the demon on the Ouija board what, what do you want us to do? And it said, um, make Mother of Toads. Write a short script based on Mother of Toads. I went, what the fuck is that? Uh, and it explained it was a story by Clark Ashton Smith. And crazily, I'd actually never read the Clark Ashton Smith story. So then on the Ouija board's advice, I hunted down the story, read it. And then I got back to the Ouija board and said, okay, I've, I've read the story. I'm not sure I really like it. Um, what do you want me to do with this? And it said, okay, you have to totally you know, readapt it. The, it's set in the present day. The first scene happens in Mirapois Market. There's two Americans trying to buy an earring. Uh, and it was very specific. Um, told me the whole outline for the 20-minute the twenty minute short. It's lucky it was a short because it's painful having to um, transcribe <laughs> things right. letter by letter on the, the planchette <laughs> like that. Uh-huh. But um, the entire script basically came over the Ouija board. Then I um, literally heard within a week that um, David Gregory at Severin was putting together the Theatre Bazaar package, mm-hmm. and he was on his way to the Cannes Film Festival. So um, I drove down from the mountain and met him on the platform at Montpellier Railway Station as he was on his way to Cannes. Uh, literally tossed him the, uh, the 20-page uh, script that had been narrated by the Ouija board. Uh, and, uh, David admirably came back within a few days and said, yes, we want to do this. And um, as such, it probably made the fastest transition from page to screen of um, of anything I've ever worked on, mm-hmm. which um, I have totally the Ouija board to thank from screwing around thinking, wild. okay, I'm bored, what can we do? Mm-hmm. That's pretty wild. Uh, I, I, I didn't have that, that, that luck uh, on my Ouija board experience, but... Uh... I just had a raccoon come and climb over my head. It was strange, but uh, Theater Bazaar was really oh, cool. Good. That's a good movie. And uh, the the short uh, shorts kind of seem to be popular now. Uh, would it be something you'd want to do again? Yeah, I'd love to do another short. I've got one in mind. Um, the problem is that um, there's no goddamn money in it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, mm-hmm. every time I do something like that, it's the same with documentaries, which just don't pay at all. Um, I always have to know in advance I'm going to be um, bankrupt for about a year or two years just paying for the blessed thing. So they always kind of punch a hole in your life, and um, they're very bad for relationships. And um, generally, I get evicted from the flats I'm staying in. Landlords don't like it when I'm working on those things. So, um, yeah, I'd like to do more. Mm-hmm. But... Um, I haven't really had the opportunity yet. Mm-hmm. That's something I've wondered about because it it seems uh, we have a lot of guests on who do shorts, and it's uh, you know they might show at a, a festival or something, but it's not like a feature where you could put it on DVD unless it's part of a anthology like Theater Bazaar. So it's kind of like well, what do you do with them after you make them? 
that's the problem. It's the same with documentaries. I mean, people just don't watch them. I mean, for, um, you know, all the best will in the world, trying to force someone to, um, to watch a short or a, um, a documentary, particularly when it's coming from someone they haven't heard of or it's a subject they don't know anything about, is super hard. You have to practically hold a gun to their heads. Mm-hmm. People don't go out of their way to seek them out. No, I myself am a fan of of, uh, of documentaries, but I, I assume you know I'm not like everybody. But uh, back to the apparition, can you uh, can you go more in detail, like what the apparition was that you saw? Um, well, I could, but um, doubtless um, you and the listeners would um, dismiss me as a as a lunatic or think <laughs> that I was um, you know suffering from um, presumably too many drugs when I was a younger person, uh-huh. but. Um, yeah, here in the um, the Pyrenees, we've got something called the White Lady. Um, she shows up in a bunch of places, but she's um, yeah, her, she's very prevalent out here, the Dame Blanche of the Pyrenees. And um, a lot of the time, um, these apparitions, which are generally um, glowing um, feminine figures, um, usually accompanied by a strong sweet smell like roses or lilies, um, <clears throat> are associated with Marian apparitions in a lot of the sites um, where these things have happened. Um, they've been take, it's been taken into the Catholic Church, like a prominent example is Lord, where um, <clears throat> Bernadette, um, Bernadette Subaru saw a glowing white lady in the grotto of Masabiel in the late 19th century. And um, the Catholic Church has now decided it's Our Lady of Lords and um, Venerator, and it's become a major site of Catholic pilgrimage. But, um, yeah, Lourdes is about um, an hour away from where I live. And I'm peppered around this area. There's a whole bunch of different sacred sources, churches and sites where um, you'll see little plaques or statues telling you about the apparition and saying that this was seen um, in the 17th century by three shepherds or was seen in the 19th century by two schoolgirls or whatever. But um, it's actually uh, crazily prevalent. Um, I didn't pay any attention to it until about 2007 when I saw the thing in the castle, um, which was essentially an apparition of the, um, of the white lady. Um, essentially looked like a, um, like a glowing person. I thought initially it was a goth or a hippie um, wearing UV paint. I, th- I initially thought there was a, going to be a Scooby-Doo explanation for it. But... Um, Unfortunately, it happened in a, the tower room of the castle where um, there was no exit door and the, um, the lady we saw um, essentially turned around and, and, and walked away from us and um, walked through the back wall of the room where um, there's nothing but a stone wall. So um, even if it was a human being wearing um, glow-in-the-dark paint, I couldn't explain how they had um, disappeared out of the room without, um, without an exit, mm-hmm. which um, put the hook in me in 2007. I then started researching into it and realized that people had been seeing the same apparition in the same place in the um, the north-facing tower of the castle for a, a few centuries. Mm-hmm. And the, the creepy part was finding accounts in French and in Occitan that we simply weren't aware of, which described exactly the same thing that, um, that we just experienced, at which point I had to start... Um, caving into the notion that it wasn't just a figment of our imagination or something that was um, conjured out of our own minds, but was an actual um, ongoing phenomena that had been happening for um, about as long as recorded history. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that it happened to us in a, a pagan place as well, somewhere associated with the, um, the heretic religion, meant we were unable to, um, to see it as um, the Blessed Virgin Mary or um, something which was um, associated with the Catholic faith, and it put me onto the track of realizing that it was um, yeah, something essentially pre-Christian that had been um, going on since before the, um, the area was Christianized. So when you said uh, that uh, you're no longer atheist and you believe all these different things, do you uh, consider yourself any, any particular religion? Um, I think I consider myself to be a pagan or a neo-pagan these days. Mm -hmm. Um, This is largely based on the fact that um, I think if we have souls, I strongly believe that animals have souls too. I find it impossible to believe that man alone is um, made in God's image, Mm -hmm. uh, that um, we alone are divine, particularly when human beings are usually such assholes and um, generally are 
it's when I'm out in the countryside or um, <clears throat> surrounded by, na by nature. If it's a swarm of bats or um, owls hooting to each other, um, I feel closer to um, the world of the supernatural at those times than I do when I'm surrounded by a bunch of other humans. And um, so I guess um, the sense that um, animals are sentient and have feelings and, you know, are aware of pain and, and, and react to us takes me away from being either a, a Christian, a Jew or a Muslim, the folk who, um, who all insist that um, only humans have a, um, some access to the divine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, why do you make the documentaries if, uh, if you know you're not going to make money on them? Well, usually it's because um, I feel guilty about not saying anything. Um, in the case of um, The Secret Glory, the film about Otto Rahn, I had spent so long uh, researching the story and had befriended so many of these weird old people that um, when um, Channel 4 Television and um, BBC Two's Contemporary History Department both decided to pass on the project and didn't think it was worth um, throwing funds at um, recording it, um, and also when my interviewees started dying, I um, felt um, a pang of guilt about letting the story disappear. So um, a part of me wanted to um, to record it before, um, while I still could. It was also because I figured that unless someone did, no one would believe it. It was um, too far-fetched. There was no point expecting people just to take my word for it. I really wanted to um, to interview as many of the surviving witnesses as I could. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, pretty much every, every one of the documentaries has usually happened um, largely by accident like that. It's usually got to the point where I've simply felt um, compelled to um, to shoot what was going on. Mm -hmm. How long did it take to, to make that movie? It took about 10 years on and off, but I literally went away and um, had the whole Moreau event in the meantime. Mm-hmm. I started on it initially, I was hired as a researcher for Channel 4 Television and um, dug up the story <clears throat> and then um, pitched it in treatment form to Channel 4 who didn't do anything with it. But the whole thing was freaky enough that then later after Dr. Moreau I remembered it and um, came back to Montsegur because I was still um, puzzled by what I'd seen there. Mm -hmm. um, going back uh, uh, when your first movie, Hardware, um can you just talk like how how you went to you know make your first movie, because uh, I would think that would be a you know obviously a big thing to to make you know a fairly big movie. So how did that all come about? Yeah, like um, pretty much everything in my life, it was largely accidental, and that um, it was through a series of circumstances so bizarre that um, you couldn't possibly reproduce them. So it stands as a poor example to folk who are trying to um, break into cinema themselves right. because I really wouldn't advise them to, uh, to do what I did. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I was trying to get a feature film made since forever and um, <clears throat> started dreaming about it when I was um, probably around 12 or 13 in a, a kind of organized way. Um, got a Super 8 camera when I was young and um, started making um, <clears throat> home Super 8 movies that um, quickly developed in complexity. Um, started, like most kids, making um, s attempts at stop motion with dinosaurs and um, small tabletop setups. was very turned on as a kid by um, Ray Harryhausen and um, Willis O'Brien. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, this being difficult and time-consuming, it, it leapt from the tabletop into real life, and I started um, persuading friends to dress up as cavemen. Uh, and... Um, I was growing up in South Africa, so I had a, a tremendous primordial landscape as a, a resource in my um, backyard, more or less. Mm -hmm. And um, the first coherent Super 8 movie I made was a, 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 a caveman movie. And um, from the caveman movie, having um, had some, some success with the Super 8, it got a, um, an award in, in London for the International Student Film Trophy from the, something called the, um, the IAC in um, 1984, although it was up against um, <clears throat> work from organized film schools from UCLA and um, UCT and the National Film School in London. The fact that um, my crazy caveman movie actually won the trophy um, gave me some inspiration as a, um, 
uh, as a crazed 15 year old and I thought okay the next place to go from caveman is into the future mm -hmm. so I started working on a super 8 movie set in the um set in the near future which was the real gestation of of hardware um this was initially an hour long super 8 in which um we see the future world it's all set over christmas uh, the the lead girl is a metal sculptress her her one-handed boyfriend comes back from the zone with his um, tripping space jockey best friend. And um, the whole setup is exactly the same as in hardware, except there's no war droid. There's no, um, there's no action. It's a Super 8 movie. They slouch around the apartment. Everyone's acting very badly because they're all teenagers. And um, nothing much happens. It's just resolutely depressing and grim. And um, then I tried developing this uh, into, a, um, into a feature script. Um, when I was in London and pushing it around, the inspirations were very much um, Make Room, Make Room by Harry Harrison, the book that um, Silent Green is based on. And it was coming out of yeah, genuine um, fear of um, being trapped in what I guess Philip K. Dick would call the, the black iron prison of the future, the um, authoritarian police state overpopulated, irradiated, environmentally destroyed with um, yeah, total surveillance and... Um, yeah, being trapped in that environment. But um, the initial screenplays weren't action movies. Then after spending about 10 years getting these scripts thrown back at me with um, different rejection notes, um, somebody basically sat me down and told me that, listen, um, if you want this to work, um, why don't you make it like Alien or Terminator? These two movies are successes at the moment. Uh, if you can drop an Alien or a Terminator robot into the story and kill a bunch of people, uh, maybe we can get it made. So I, I took this advice and um, sat down and wrote the Mark 13 cyborg into the script and killed all of my characters and had it run amok in Jill's apartment. Uh -huh. And um, the, the final draft happened over about a, one week. I think I've, I was playing largely Iron Maiden music at the time. It was somewhere in the, um, yeah, the mid-80s. Then um, I pushed the thing out to everyone and um, got no response at all, and um, really it didn't seem to make any difference, and went on with my life, and um, I made music videos for about um, four years. And then after getting sick and tired of making music videos, I more or less gave up, and um, went to Afghanistan on a whim. Um, went to the Hindu Kush mountains, wanted to get out of the music business, and um, this was in the late 80s. And then um, got caught and got swept up into the um, the defeat of the Russian army, and then the um, the civil war that brought the Taliban in. Mm -hmm. And um, after a particularly big battle, the siege of Jalalabad, which was the um, provincial capital of Ningrahar province, I was in a um, a Saudi Red Crescent hospital in Pakistan, on the Pakistani side of the border in Peshawar. And there in the Red Crescent Hospital, somebody managed to reach me from London, who um, turned out to be a producer named Trix Worrell, who was the, who'd made a movie called um, For Queen and Country with Denzel Washington. And Trix had tracked me down and wanted to, they wanted to option my script. Um, this copy of the hardware script had been floating around London for um, years and years, like a, a raisin dropped into, the into a glass of champagne. I'd, I'd given up all hope on it. And completely without me knowing, it had gone from one set of hands to another, to another, to another, and had finally found its way all the way to um, yeah, Steve Woolley at Palace Films. And um, they had a yen to try and um, make a low-budget sci-fi horror movie to um, emulate the success of Evil Dead and to see if they could yeah, do something for under a million that um, they could release on video. And they picked on hardware. Then they had to find me. I'd, I'd dropped out of the business and gone somewhere totally inaccessible. So um, by the time um, Trix found me, he was already very desperate. I remember he was using a lot of F words. It was kind of, you have no idea how fucking hard we've been working to fucking find you, mate. <laughs> uh, I recall initially I was so confused and um, offended by the phone call that I hung up on him. Uh, and uh, didn't take it seriously for uh, a period of time. I, I certainly, um, <clears throat> at that stage, didn't believe the movie would get made. Then um, <clears throat> when um, they, they, they used extraordinary means to get me back from Afghanistan, essentially they, um, 
they chartered one of my immediate ex-girlfriend at that point and um, paid her good money to um, find a way of um, getting me on an aeroplane. And um, yeah, I got precipitated pretty much directly from the Afghan conflict into um, developing hardware. That's crazy. I mean, hardware was kind of a, um, a non-recurring phenomena uh -huh. because I think the, it was only it was made for eight hundred thousand um, for under a million. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that this was possible is because it used um, kind of almost teenage labor. Like the average age on the set was probably about sixteen. Um, the what few computer graphics there are was done on a school computer somewhere. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, we were all very badly paid for our efforts, and we all worked insanely hard for um, a a brief crazy period of time, and um, got um, as a result delivered something to Palace Miramax that um, was batting very much above its potential, mm -hmm. that looked uh, a lot better than it should possibly have looked for the for the money. And then, much to my surprise, they gave it a full theatrical release. When we were making it, I thought it would um, go direct to video and would be, um, yeah, floating around in um, the video bucket with all the other um, Terminator and Alien ripoffs of the period. Yeah, yeah. But um, the the film looked sufficiently good that um, yeah, they went theatrical with it and it got a a pretty wide release in the states. Mm -hmm. How how did you end up in Afghanistan? That's just. Uh... Uh, very, very. That was uh, totally out of out of nowhere. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said I couldn't recommend that anyone else follow <laughs> yeah, my right. route to making my first right. feature because right. it makes no kind of sense. <laughs> I, I literally hammered at the doors of the industry for years and years, and it was at the point when I completely stopped trying that uh, the thing worked. <laughs> I literally, yeah, give, give, thrown in the towel and given up. It happened because I was doing a really bad music video. I'd been doing um, about one music video a month to pay the rent for about four or five years. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> it had gotten down to the point where I really had to shoot in order to um, <clears throat> keep the entourage going and um, pay the overheads. So um, we were getting less and less choosy about what tracks we were shooting videos for. Mm -hmm. And this was a really lame dance track that sh we should never have been working on. That was um, <clears throat> targeted at like 12-year-olds or 13-year-olds, and we had lots of um, children dancing around with um, cell-animated characters that were, were added later. And the whole thing was so far away from what I wanted to do as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, having a, um, a serious um, identity crisis, um, shooting that kind of material. Um, I've got, as a director, I've got a, um, a first-on, last-off policy which means that um, I like to arrive before anyone else, um, get to the location before the, before the vans arrive, uh, and know which way the camera is pointing before um, the rest of the crew gets there. And then I like to stick around until all the cable is washed and all the lenses are packed away into their cases and the whole thing is de-rigged and the um, location was... This is largely a policy born out of working with no money because... Um, <clears throat> If you're, if you're underpaying people the whole time, people the crew will mutiny unless they feel that you're working as, <clears throat> as hard as they are or, um, or harder. So um, I didn't like to leave the, sh the shitty work to other folk. I think if you just jump in your car and go home after you've called, um, called a wrap and leave everyone else to deal with the carnage, you will lose people very fast. So um, on this dumb video, I'd, um, I was the last off as usual. And um, shipping out of the location with the trucks at the end of the shoot, the truck driver in the, in the vehicle I was in um, was complaining about the gears sticking on the truck. And um, he said, this thing's as difficult to drive as a BTR-60. And I recognized this as a lightweight um, Soviet troop transporter that had been used in the invasion of Afghanistan and said, well, how did you get to drive a BTR-60? And he then explained that he'd been in a jihad in Afghanistan and um, was now on hard times in London doing whatever shit work he could in order to save up enough money to um, <clears throat> to go back to the jihad and fight the Russians. Mm -hmm. So on a whim, I said, well, look, if I um, pay for your plane ticket, uh, will you take me with you? I was that pissed after the music video. Mm -hmm. It was a... Um, I, can't, I wanted an out any which way, and um, he was good to his word. He, um, I paid for his plane ticket, and he got me in. Mm -hmm. did, did you actually fight? 
In the end, yes, I tried to avoid it. Because mm -hmm. that wasn't the reason I went out there. I You're was um, mostly interested in, Kaf in Kafiristan, <clears throat> in the land of the Kafir. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, a little known fact, but um, Islam arrived in the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan in 1910. Like, um, here in Europe, um, Christianity slaughtered the pagans and shut down um, sorcery in um, the 12th and the 13th centuries. But in the Hindu Kush, 1910 was when uh, militant Islam arrived in the Hindu Kush and started executing the high priests and burning the idols. And um, they destroyed all the vineyards because um, wine isn't allowed in Islam. But prior to 1910, the place had been um, fully blown pagan, which is why it's called um, Kafiristan, land of the Kafir. The, the Kafirs are the um, what the Muslims call the ones that don't believe in, in Islam. And crazily enough, it had, um, there'd been a... Um, a British viceroy, um, Sir George Scott Robertson, who had been there in the late 19th century, who just walked in there for donkey and wrote an extraordinary account of, um, of shamanism and the, the deities of this um, very wild, warlike people. Um, Rudyard Kipling's Man Who, Would, Man Who Would Be King is based on this and makes reference to, um, to, to uh, Robertson's expedition. So yeah, I'd read Robertson's book, and I was very intrigued to be in a land where um, th that way of life had only been wiped out um, at that stage um, 79 years before I got there, less than a century. Mm -hmm. So I figured it would still be um, very, very vibrant, um, that it would still be an opportunity to be extremely close to um, the authentic um, Dark Age experience. I had no interest in either communism or um, or militant Islam as ideologies and didn't really care which one of the, the sides won, but um, did want to um, to be part of that milieu, to um, to see how it felt to be in a, a country which was um, unelectrified and um, where there was no written language and um, where there was white spots on the map and where people still um, yeah, believe in jinn and in um, in magic. What was that whole experience like? Um, one of the best things I ever did, beyond doubt. I mean, I'm not sure that even hardware would have gotten made if I hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. And that it certainly got me off my ass. Uh, and, um, at the time, utterly terrifying. Uh, and certainly towards the end of it, there were long periods of screaming and begging and um, groveling. Um, when we were under fire for a sustained period of time, um, you get to see pretty much everyone reduced to um, trying to literally bury themselves in the ground out of um, out of fear and panic, uh, and uh, just a desire to be anywhere else but there. Uh, and, um, certainly, we um, <laughs> we tried really hard to escape. Uh, and, um, we're convinced we would be killed for um, a long period of time, but. Um, at the same time, almost the moment I did escape and get out of the country again, um, I started missing it, uh, and, uh, regretting the being back in the so-called real world. Yeah, uh, I just think that would be such a uh, to go from making videos to to that, and then back to going to make a movie. It's such a such a drastic change in in, in culture and, and and where you are. It was extremely disorientating. I mean, I like to think that hardware is what I had instead of PTSD. Oh. It was certainly what I got instead of counseling. Yeah. I just um, yeah, went straight into storyboarding and shooting the thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if, um, if hardware has anything at all it, it, that um, makes it work as a movie, it may be some kind of sense of hysteria. It's a very um, freaked out, hysterical movie. Uh, as the the film goes on, the the characters become more and more um, <laughs> traumatized and, and, and hysterical. Yeah. I think to a, a degree which we don't often see in um, in normal action movies. Mm -hmm. Now, would would you say that's a direct result of, uh, of of being in Afghanistan? Like, did the script like change at all? Uh, from the script didn't change that much. I mean, we were just having to deal with the problems of um, getting the money out of Miramax uh -huh. and um, all the compromises, and uh, um, I, we had to work with what we had, what, whatever we had. So um, the script was forced to change to accommodate um, 
but uh, basically the weird, the weird impositions that came along, like um, Dylan McDermott, for instance, was um, basically um, given to us at the last minute. Um, Miramax's deal was dependent on, a, a cho on us choosing one of um, three male actors that they would fund who they were pushing. And Dylan was the, um, the best of the three that were um, on offer. Um, he came onto the project just before we started shooting. And um, really didn't look anything like the character in the script. Mm -hmm. The um, character in the script was originally a mechanic who had, um, was working on different um, war machines in the zone who had lost his hand in an industrial accident. And Mo was a, a cancer-ridden, tattoo-covered, um, grubby, scarred um, zone mechanic character who was obviously addicted to various drugs and um, dying of cancer. Um, very different from Dylan, who turned up looking very um, healthy yeah. and um, very ripped, uh, short hair and very clean scrubbed and uh, yeah, utterly unlike the, um, the complete wreck that Jill's boyfriend originally was conceived as. Mm -hmm. and, um, so when Dylan came aboard, I had to yeah, rework his character. He's, he then becomes a former soldier. Uh, and um, I also found that Dylan was, was Christian. Um, had a, a, a genuine Christian faith. He carried his Bible with him, which intrigued me, especially after the Afghan thing. So I carried that over into the film and uh, decided to keep um, Dylan as being, um, to be, as being Christian. And it was Dylan who found the, um, the reference, who, look, who thought of looking up the, the cyborg in the Bible and found that um, the book of Mark, chapter 13, was um, a really awesomely apocalyptic quote. This wasn't in the script originally. Um, yeah, it came completely from um, yeah, from Dylan's participation in the movie. Huh. So there were things like that which yeah changed. Mm -hmm. Did you have an actor already uh, uh, picked to play the character? Um, yeah, I did. Crazy enough, I uh, um, I was pushing for an actor that um, insanely um, Miramax didn't want. Now, who was it? I um, hate to say it, but yeah, um, originally, um, uh, and it could completely have been this way if it wasn't for Harvey and Bob Weinstein, um, Mo and Shades, the two male leads, had been cast as Bill Paxton and um, Jeffrey Combs. Oh, wow. <laughs> and this is right after Near Dark. Yeah. Uh, and I, really, I, I got on with Paxton, really, really liked him. Uh, and um, I would say he'd been in Aliens, and um, I thought had yeah cachet because of the Cameron connection, and yeah. um, was pushing hard for Paxton, and, <laughs> and I imagined it yeah the character being much more Bill Paxton, and um, I guess in those days it would have been in um, near dark and dark backward mode, uh -huh. with the kind of rockabilly um, long hair, which is with uh -huh. all of which would have fitted into the um, the heroin addict um, mechanic kind of um, figure that. Um, Mo was originally conceived, conceived as. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of dark, the dark backward. I think this is the only time I've ever heard anyone uh, talk about the movie besides myself. <laughs> yeah, I was, a, I was a Paxton fan right yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and your dark's very cool, too. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I was a Martini Raj fan as well, so... Uh, 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 and he fought hard to get him to the movie. But what went wrong was because um, of, of Stacy. Um, for step for the for Jill, I had um, found um, this lady Stacy Travis, who I was absolutely convinced had to be Jill, and um, Stacy really hadn't done anything before. Mm -hmm. uh, she'd like um, been in a bit of TV sitcom. She'd been in the the Julie Brown show, kind of playing a a ditzy waitress, but she had no um, no real CV at all. And um, in the fight with Miramax. Uh, Miramax finally said, "Okay, we will let you cast this um, complete unknown as the as the lady, but you have to give up the the male lead. You have to let us cast uh, cast the other one, uh -huh. which was um, yeah galling. In the end, I took that decision because I I knew that Jill was more important than Mo, and that Mo got killed off, and um, the film really rested on on." On Jill's shoulders, on Stacy's shoulders, so I, I fought to hold on to her, and as a result, I had to um, give up my original um, male lead. Mm -hmm. uh, did you end up getting along with uh, w with the new lead? Um, not much. Mm -hmm. A little. Um, 
I mean, I, enough that I was able to, um, <clears throat> to I think, make the character work. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wouldn't have, it would not have worked had he been playing the character as written. So um, I think we reconfigured him in a way that that does work, and um, Dylan does some nice work at times. But um, at the same time, we, there, there were definite problems. Um, right at the beginning of the shoot, Dylan was um, dumped by Julia Roberts, who um, dumped him for Kiefer Sutherland right around the beginning of Hardware. Um, Dylan was super depressed. And um, was sort of acting as if he thought Julia would be watching the whole time. So, um, like, he just never really touches Stacy. And um, it, or it, or if he feels almost allergic to um, to being close to the female lead uh, in the love scene, Stacy had to literally pick Dylan up and slam him backwards and forwards on the mattress <laughs> to make it look like he was moving. <laughs> or it, but so that he, he he had a tendency to get super wooden um, when um, when he was around Stacy. Mm-hmm. And um, he also never figured out he was in a horror movie. What do you mean? He um, he had a, a conception of it being a sci-fi action movie that I guess was slightly at odds with the escalating um, volumes of, um, of of gore and graphic violence, mm-hmm. um, which ex- will become more extreme and pronounced uh, the deeper into the film you go. Where um, really by the last act, the film's a, a total fucking abattoir, which. Um, did freak Dylan out and um, as a result in the scene in the trip sequence for instance where he's um, he's seen carving carving up his own flesh with the boot knife um, which is the old um, LSD nightmare of yeah cutting into yourself with some kind of sharp object while you're tripping and um, but yet yeah, in all those scenes Dylan's hand doubled um, it's a, it's an actual double because, um, yeah, he, he couldn't go that far with the gore in the stronger gore sequences. We doubled him. Hmm. That's, yeah, that's, uh, do you know, uh, what he thought of the finished movie? Um, I think he was pretty dubious about it at first. It probably took about 10 years for him to really embrace it. <laughs> I mean, now Dylan has no problems about appearing obviously in horror films. He's done like, um, all kinds of horror material. Uh-huh. But, um, yeah, back then, I think it was a combination of the Christian thing and just breaking up with Julia. He he had moral issues about the tone of the material. Mm-hmm. There was a particular showdown on the set on um, the day we shot the um, what was commonly thought of as the power drill rape scene um, when um, Stacy's on the floor and the droid has her legs apart and it has this obvious phallic whirling power drill thing uh-huh. um, which um, freaked out the um, two of the ladies on the set who were um, they, um, a couple called Annie and Babs who were set dressers and Annie and Babs decided that um, I, we, we could not possibly shoot a scene where a woman was sexually threatened with a, a, a phallic power drill mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, um, because I was young and crazy and um, Coming off the Afghan war, I think I responded in a way of uh, prob- probably unsympathetically uh, and um, took the attitude of, um, fuck you, you're set dressers. Um, this scene happens the way it's supposed to happen, um, which then um, caused a, a, a crew mutiny where um, Annie and Babs pulled the, um, I guess, pressed the feminist button and got all the different ladies to um, talk to the men. And the entire crew and Dylan um, all um, down tools and refused to go on working unless we dropped the power drill um, rapes in. At which point, I think what we did was um, I, I seem to remember going, fuck you, we're doing this anyway. Uh, and, um, st- that scene shot with Stacy and Steve Chivers, was the, the DP, was operating because um, Tim Morris Jones, the normal operator, um, yeah, couldn't do that sequence thanks to pressure from his girlfriend. And I know that um, Dylan had, at that point, had a thing for Babs, the, um, the set dresser. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I w- w- was, was also of a mind that it was a, a step too far. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, I saw the movie you know, back in the day and stuff, but I watched it again, obviously, for uh, the interview. 
And it's uh, a lot of it's like uh, just as topical, more topical today uh, than when you made it, which, you know, like the drones. And uh, there's even a line, I don't want to spoil the movie, but I'm sure people have seen listen to it. At the end, it's, uh, you know, they're talking about mass producing them and they talk about how it's going to create jobs. And I was like, wow, that's like right out of today, you know, uh, about, you know. Yeah, I'm just sorry the sequel never got made. Um, there's a perfectly good sequel script, which um, was written about a year or two years after Hardware, which um, not only exists, but um, I put it up on the net about 20 years ago on, uh, when I realized that the legal problems around Hardware were so great that trying to legitimately get the film funded was always, was always going to be a problem. But the sequel script is insanely topical. Uh, mostly because it opens out the um, the story, and we get to find out more about the um, the world that they're living in. Mm-hmm. But um, the sequel script literally starts with a family of Mexicans trying to get across the Rio Grande, mm-hmm. who um, initially uh, escape drones, uh, make it through some kind of containment barrier, um, are unable to dis- uh, to to read the warnings on the on the wall. Uh, and then on the far side of the wall, one of them is, loses a leg to an anti-personnel mine, which slows them down. And then they are hunted and exterminated by um, a pack of um, Mark 13 cyborgs who have not only got motion detectors and are uh, heat sensitive, but also now fully weaponized um, to have um, yeah, microwave weapons, which enable them to, um, to cook you from the inside out, something which um, we didn't do in the first movie. I figured if the droid was weaponized in Hardware One, um, Jill would have no chance at all. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, the sequel script is is crazy topical. Uh, and I really, really regret that that never got made. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't think there'd ever be a chance of it uh, to ever be made? Well, the basic Mexican border wall thing was always a problem. I mean, uh, it, uh, the funny thing is, even though now they're talking about actually building the thing, yeah. it, it's still kind of too much of a hot potato to um, to use as a sci-fi action setup. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's very strange because uh, that was parodied on uh, on South Park and everything. Now it uh, looks like it's actually going to become reality. The wall. Yeah, very creepy indeed. Mm-hmm. I mean, the notion that we're speeding towards a future which resembles a um. A 70s um, dystopian sci-fi novel is, um, has never been stronger. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really feels like we're in um, Philip K. Dick's um, Radio Free album with, with yeah, elements of Harry Harrison's Make Room, Make Room. But it's, um, yeah, it's certainly creepy living to see this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I thought it was interesting in hardware that... Uh... Uh, even though you know it's kind of a, a dystopian world and everything, uh, that she's still making art. That like art would still survive in a world like that, and people would be interested in making it. Yeah, that they surely will. I mean, um, I guess the one influence of um, hardware is coming out of Afghanistan, is that it's a very third world vision of America, and that. Um, it's kind of cheaper than Blade Runner. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the street scenes and the milieu that they live in uh, feels like it's a cross between Blade Runner and Mega City One and um, Peshawar or um, yeah, some of the, um, the cities I've been seeing in um, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And certainly in the border areas, there's places where um, everything is merged into one. So you go into a shop and you can buy um, boiled sweets and gasoline and flour and chickpeas and ammunition for your gun and or also plastic explosives and new DVDs. Like so, um, yeah, some aspect of that had bled into the movie. And um, I think there'll always be um, crazy people making art and um, drawing on their faces or... Um, I saw the Mujahideen like to um, crochet the whole time. They were big on knitting and crochet. Mm-hmm. So while waiting to attack people, they'd be sitting there crocheting um, gun cozies <laughs> and ghetto blaster cozies and very elaborate little bits of, um, of, of, of yeah, crochet work. Um, so I think that'll always, that'll always be going on. Mm-hmm. Oh, why, why the American flag painted on the, uh, on the, on the, the helmet, on the, on the, uh, the face? Crazy enough, like everything else, it was an accident. <laughs> Another one of those happy accidents. In the script, the droid had night and day on its face. Uh, and, um, 
this is meant to be particularly strong when um, Lincoln opens the blinds and sees the thing looking back in at him. And I wanted um, a rising sun on the one side and stars and, and the crescent moon on the other side so the droid would be literally night and day. Uh, when we were doing the paint job, the, um, the, the rays of light from the rising sun uh, met the stars. And we went, oh, hang on. And um, we all of a sudden realized it looked like um, Captain America's gas tank from Easy Rider. Okay, that's pretty cool. Mm, but yeah, pr pretty much an accident. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool, though. Uh, who did the effects? Because the effects uh, are still, still hold up. Yeah, and no, it was an awesome array of kids. Uh, we, we had an incredible team of different folk, uh, many of whom are insanely talented in their own right, um, who are all very young and um, got slung together. So, um, yeah, we had a whole bunch of folk from um, Steve Norrington to um, Chris Cunningham on that one. Mm -hmm. um, little Chris literally turned 16 in the course of the shoot, and Chris oh, wow. went on to do the um, the Aphex Twins videos. Uh -huh. And um, the main droid guy was someone called Paul Catlin, who um, actually left show business and went on to um, design um, prosthetic limbs for um, yeah paraplegics. But um, somehow together, the, um, they were able to rebuild that droid practically every day because we destroyed it practically every day. <laughs> it was very weak in real life and um, just seemed to get totally trashed and scene after scene. And then the, the team of kids would um, somehow miraculously put the thing back together again and have it um, semi-ready for action the next day. Uh, how how did Lemmy and Iggy Pop get involved? Was that uh, any connections of yours through the, the music videos? In a roundabout way, yeah. Um, most of it was through the the, um, the music videos, but all of it was accidental. Like, um, Lemmy got involved because the cab driver was originally meant to be Sinead O'Connor, uh, who was in her bald phase, and it was meant to be a sort of tank girl thing. Mm -hmm. And um, then um, Sinead dropped out at the last moment because she was otherwise engaged and there was a, a frantic struggle to see who the cab driver would be and um, Lemmy just sort of happened to be around. Uh, there was a cold call and um, did it at the last moment for a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> but um, it was literally parachuted into the part. And, um, yeah, um, kind of a surprise. Iggy, the same deal. Um, Iggy's character was originally meant to be played by John Lydon and I'd done video work for Leiden, but then um, right at the time we were meant to be recording that stuff, he was um, stuck in the middle of a, um, an insane legal battle with Virgin, and it just um, split the UK for um, California, and um, all of a sudden um, trying to get Leiden into a studio was difficult, and again, um, Iggy was um, the next thing. It was like, okay, um, who can we call? Now, where did the Wibberly Wobbly song come from? Um, it's a genuine song. Oh, it is. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it was. A, it's a, It's apparently a drinking song from like about um, from pre-war. Uh, it goes back to the 1920s or somewhere around there. <laughs> it really. Uh, it stands out. Uh, I'm. A, I'm a fan of the word pre <laughs> well, But so he lies in the song in the movie because he says I, I. I made that up. I made that up. Uh, I didn't really make it up. I have heard it, but it's from like my mother's generation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I also like his um, sword. Uh, I think it's a nice touch. But go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, Bill improvises a lot. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we love about Bill. Bill Hootkins, who plays um, Lincoln, is um, Bill improved a lot of that character, uh, and um, it was really hard to edit because he was hardly ever saying the same thing twice. <laughs> and, um, so many of the things he was saying were so insane and, uh, and so funny. Uh -huh. Like, baby, I'm so hard I could cut diamonds. And uh -huh. Just insane things were coming out of his mouth and take after take, the trying not to laugh. And, um, he was wonderful to actually work with and gave us yes, so much in terms of that character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I like the cold sore, too. I think that's a nice little touch to the character. <laughs> yeah, that was super, super gross. <laughs> yeah, yeah everyone, everyone was terrified of him on set. Oh. I mean, he was so he was so good at being that character that the makeup girl <laughs> really didn't want to deal with him, great. and um, everyone was very leery around him, <laughs> not realizing that of course Bill is just a total chameleon, and um, is completely inhabiting that part. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the movie was finished and uh, you know it gets a theatrical release, uh, what was that like for you? 
Um, hugely disorientating. Um, bizarre. I mean, most towers in a really bad mood. <laughs> That's what normally is. I mean, like um, if, now I'm amazed at how uh, at what a bad time I had um, at the um, the height of um, hardware success. But um, there's always stuff which is coming after you in this world. I mean, um, they kept taking away pieces of the movie the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like um, hardware got re- got um, censored and reduced the whole way. Like um, there were two extremely extended gore sequences that were um, were meant to shoot during the making of the film, which Miramax already nixed. These were meant to be the demise of the dwarf and um, the security guard Vernon, both of whom um, were originally intended for far nastier things than what happens to them in the film. And both these scenes were already removed by Miramax. And um, then um, during the edit, we had to um, drop more things, Um, like um, the Holocaust footage on the television which was originally playing in the background when um, Mo and Jill make love, and, um, that which again was seen as like um, totally untenable. You couldn't be intercutting um, images of real death with sex and, um, and the Leiden song, so all the, the real death images were hauled out in the edit. So the film kept getting lamer and kept getting tamer as it went along, like a snowball that kind of melts the closer it gets to the public. And um, then in, in the United States, um, it got initially given an X rating. Mm. So we um, hit the campaign trail and campaigned very heavily against the X. Hardware was one of a, a bunch of films that got the X that year. I was up there with, um, I think, Al Modavar's Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down, and the Greenaway film, um, Cook the Thief. And um, there was a Wayne Wang movie at that time, too. Um, Life is cheap, um, toilet paper is expensive, all of which were given X ratings, which meant that they couldn't play in conventional cinemas or um, receive um, really any publicity in newspapers. Mm -hmm. So um, this um, insane amount of campaigning in the States on every um, radio show or um, every um, cable show we could get onto um, eventually led into the, um, the creation of the R rating. And um, finally, an R was introduced, and then hardware was cut for an R, which meant that we um, again lost a lot of um, gore close-ups. Um, Miramax removed half the trip sequence, and they also um, removed another two more pieces of the um, <laughs> of the Jill and Mo um, relationship because they thought it made um, the characters appear unsympathetic because they were being too mean to each other. And as a result, they were kept taking little pieces of the movie away. So much of that initial experience of the theatrical release, I remember being um, filled with rage at the various people who are constantly trying to <laughs> re-edit the movie or, um, or, or, or change it in various ways. Mm-hmm. And um, it took a while to, um, yeah, to get any real enjoyment out of it. Mm-hmm. Would, would there, uh, could there ever be a director's cut released, uh, or is that stuff all lost? Um, the closest we've got is the, um, the one that's out now from... Um, from um, on Blu-ray, mm-hmm. in that um, this at least reinstates um, all of the sensor cuts. Mm-hmm. Um, everything that was cut for an R in the um, 80s is now is now back in, which I'm happy with that. And it also reinstates the um, the excisions made by Miramax for the for the US release. So I think the Blu-ray versions the um, the most intact that we'll that we'll ever see. Anything that was um, deleted before the um, creation of the first married answer print really no longer exists. Unfortunately, there's no um, there's no director's cut as such. Mm-hmm. Now, I read that your your father uh, tried to be a movie maker or was like a movie maker. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that. And was he alive when when your movie came out? When Hardware came out? Nah, no, he didn't make it. Um, yeah, I had a, I, I scarcely knew my dad because my mom um, divorced him when I was four, mm-hmm. so, and um, was really, um, I guess, of a um, a radical um, feminist frame of mind that she felt that um, kids didn't really need fathers or um, or male, um, I get male models um, to. Um, to uh, form their personalities and they're growing up. So she didn't actually even bother telling me who my dad was until I was 13. 
I was very, I had to literally confront her on the issue to try and even figure out um, who my father was. Uh, and yeah, as they were divorced, I was real, real young, and he had um, a, a faint memory. But um, the deal was, yeah, he was um, some kind of failed filmmaker who had um, gotten zapped for stealing um, camera equipment from the set of the Thief of Baghdad, the um, the Pal Pressburger movie, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, it's had fled um, England at some point back after the war and um, gone to Rhodesia and then South Africa and reinvented himself as a travel photographer uh, and um, did take nice landscape photographs and still screwed around with um, with film. Mm -hmm. But So um, when I was very small, um, there were these um, leftover e bits of editing equipment, Steenbecks and um, editing benches that I used to play around with as a kid which were yeah, left from my dad some um, experiments with it. Also, he did the one very key bit of parenting, which is that when I was four, he um, showed me my first movie. He um, brought home a 16 millimeter print of King Kong, hmm. the original, the one and only. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think this experience was yeah, an important one to me as a child. There was no um, television at that point in South Africa. So I hadn't really been exposed to moving images, and um, Kong made a um, a huge impact on me from an early age. And then, as I came back and watched Kong over and over as a kid, I also, I guess, um, identified with the Carl Denham character in Kong, and um, decided that um, this is what I wanted to do for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, when I grew up, it would be great to be a crazed filmmaker and um, go off to places where um, nobody had ever been before and try to um, yeah, bring back things that, that yeah, no, um, no one in the West had ever seen. Yeah. You mentioned King Kong and earlier you mentioned uh, Harryhausen. Um, what, are, what were some of your favorite uh, stop motions? Well, um, I guess my next big love after Kong was um, Golden Voyage of Sinbad, mm -hmm. which um, blew me away when I was 10. I mean, um, I, li I enjoy the other Harryhausens, but it seems like Golden Voyage was the one where he really gets it right. And um, the um, homunculus being brought back to life by the sorcerer using the, the drop of his blood and the, the moment where the, the statue of Kali gets down from the altar and dances. There are um, some super strong scenes in that film. So, um, yeah, I was in, in, enchanted when I was young, and then the more I learned about it, and the more I realized that O'Brien and um, Harry Housen were these um, essentially very antisocial kids who had um, spent most of their time sitting um, locked to their father's garages, build, trying to building dioramas and um, making these prehistoric battles happen insanely slowly, one frame at a time. Yeah. Um, I, I found myself drawn into it. Uh, for me, I, I don't think anything beats a skeleton scene, the skeleton fight uh, in... Uh, uh, in Jason, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's amazing. I, I, I tried to get him on many times on the show. Uh, he almost did it once, I think, but he was uh, it was like his 90th birthday, but unfortunately never uh, got to happen. But uh, what, like, other... Um, what kind of horror movies were you into? Um... Back then, my my mum got got me reading when I was very young, mm -hmm. so um, I was very lucky to read um, Bram Stoker Dracula when I was um, very very little, six or seven, uh, and I also met H. P. Lovecraft and people when I was old John Blackwood and people when I was very very young. So um, and then um, this translated into um, my mum taking me to see um, um, the original Christopher Lee horror of Dracula and. Um, yeah, taste the blood of Dracula and some of the the Hammer horrors, and I became a big um, Christopher Lee, um, Peter Cushing fan. Mm -hmm. uh, w were those movies like readily available in South Africa? Not really. They were usually drive-in double bills. Mm -hmm. uh, most of that stuff I got to see because my mom had a liking for, for um, yeah dark fantasy, mm -hmm. uh, and it was easy to persuade her to go to a Hammer double bill at the drive-in. Uh, and I would um, hide under the blankets in the back seat, and she'd drive in. Uh, so uh, I was, yeah, there was a strong driving culture. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of um, great trashy movies that um, literally only played the drive-in circuit that didn't really, um, yeah, um, break into the mainstream cinemas. I, I remember Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires being a, 
a particular favorite at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oddly enough, that's how I watched a lot of horror movies as a kid, because my mom liked horror, and my brother's nine years older, a uh, single mother, and so she would take him uh, to the drive-in with his friends, and instead of getting a babysitter, she'd take me along ever since I can remember. And, you know, and I remember, there's always a story they tell me it was like I was six or something, and we went to Night of the Living Dead, and I like, wow, uh, that's tough. yeah, I was upset <laughs> when the when the car blows up and like the zombies are eating everybody, and my mom looked at me and said, "Oh, they're just having a barbecue," and then I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty strong movie. That's some strong meat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, how did you get along with the Weinstein's? Um. Well. I got along okay, I guess, at the beginning, because I didn't really know who they were. Um, and um, this was back at the um, the dawn of Miramax, and they, they um, I guess, were, um, were mostly um, familiar to me as the people who had... Um, the closest thing they came to actually directing a movie, really, was The Burning. Mm-hmm. Um, they were very... Um, they're actually on set on The Burning. And, um, it's like a Friday the 13th knockoff. Yeah. And this kind of exemplified what Harvey and Bob really wanted in the movie. They they were really looking at a lot of um, yeah, Friday the Thirteenth type Slash. type cliches. They kept asking for more false scares for scenes where people would walk backwards and bump into things. They wanted dumb um, kids. They desperately wanted us to write teenagers or um, kids kids who would get naked into the uh, into the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, I could kind of understood where they were coming from. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah, as it went went along, and I guess I was um, fairly arrogant about refusing to um, change things or uh, constantly fighting for um, to try and um, <clears throat> stop the movie from um, mutating into completely out of shape, um, we, uh, we became, um, yeah, I guess, clo- um, more and more antagonistic towards each other. And um, one of the problems was at some point... Um, Harvey, I believe, started thinking that the character of Bill Hootkins's character, um, Lincoln Weinberg Jr., um, the sleazy voyeur pervert character, was a joke on him, <laughs> uh, which it wasn't, uh-huh. because in fact this character was always named Lincoln Weinberg Jr. right back to the earliest drafts of the movie from um, a good ten years previously. So it was no 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 reflection on Harvey, but somehow he started to believe that um, this was a um, it was deliberately insulting, uh-huh. uh, and um, then um, it's also there's there's real issues of Harvey. I mean, um, yeah, Harvey's got some Bill Cosby type issues, <laughs> which um, I believe will um, come to the surface at some point. Oh wow! That's, but that's um, he's such a he's such a powerful man that um, it hasn't got out. And I think um, Ashley Judd said something about it in. Um, in one of the in one of the larger American periodicals, but it was just mentioned as being a a famous um, Hollywood producer who had previously been profiled in this magazine, but it didn't say um, who exactly it was that she was talking about. Mm. But um, Harvey's always been a bit of a predator, and um, this came out several times in the course of the um, of the production, and eventually climaxed the situation in Cannes where um, he was trying to get into Stacy's room. Uh, and um, Stacy, my actress, um, phoned me and said, "What can I do?" Um, you have can't, Harvey's trying to get in the door and is insisting that um, I will never work again unless I do what he says. Wow! So, um, Stacy did not open the door to Harvey, mm-hmm. and um, Stacy pretty much never worked again. Which, um, because Stacey was great in fucking hardware and, um, deserved a part after that. And, um, I kind of always held that against Harvey. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's something that's been, that's come up a lot on a lot of different, um, a lot of different productions. And I suspect that, um, at some point the, um, the floodgates will open and you will, will hear a lot more about that from different people. Mm-hmm. But, um, Folk being as chicken shit as they are, there's been a um, yeah, Harvey's been allowed to um, pretty much get away with it. Mm-hmm. Now, when you 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 know you have like firsthand knowledge of something like that happening, like uh, I would assume that has to like sour your whole experience and opinion of you know working uh working with them or working like in Hollywood movies. 
Well, only if you've got a if you've got the wrong expectations to begin with. I mean, I I was never um, very keen on um, on Miramax, to, but I mean they control the, the universe out there. So in terms of independent film distribution, so um, you know you 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 kind of know that you've you know you're doing deals with um folk who um you probably wouldn't necessarily want to take home and introduce to your mum, like um. Miramax's marketing genius, which was something that I've heard people repeat over and over again about how they had this genius for independent film marketing, um, pretty much came down to picking up at that stage um, low budget um, foreign movies and then marketing them to their lowest common denominator. Like um, in the States, um, The Cook, the Thief, um, the Greenaway movie is sold with a, post, a, a, a photographic poster of um, Helen Mirren in lingerie eating ice cream in a suggestive way from a spoon. Um, hardware, they like whomped up the word hard. hard um, hardware, hardcore, um, hard sex, hard violence. Um, and then they put the word Terminator in big letters on the poster. Terminator for the 90s. Um, I, I, I thought their marketing genius was pretty crass. Um, the same went with yeah, Sex, Lies and Videotape, another big hit for them was uh, sold by a picture of Laura San Giacomo sitting on a mattress with her legs crossed. So I, I kind of had a sense of um, where they were coming from, which was taking um, yeah, foreign art movies, um, Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down is another example, and marketing them as if they were sex movies, which um, made them um, yeah, tremendously successful. Mm -hmm. Did they want you to do uh, more movies for them after Hardware? Essentially, no. <laughs> um, hardware was a hit for them, uh -huh. but um, we were unable to translate the um, success of hardware into getting anyone to do a sequel or to, um, to, to reboot the thing or to even license it for um, games or models or um, any form of um, franchising at all. Um, They got hooked into Dust Devil, but um, I never had the impression that they were very pleased about being part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was the experience like uh, doing Dust Devil? Well, um, Dust Devil at the time, because it was before Island of Dr. Moreau, I thought was the worst possible location shooting experience of all time. But um, now it seems kind of trivial. Uh -huh. But... Um, The Dust Devil was also, yeah, really a thousand miles of rough road and again happened by accident in all kinds of horrible ways. I mean, it started as a 16 millimeter movie. Um, it was something I tried to shoot again in South Africa, like hardware. And it started out being the simplest thing I could think of. It was like, what's the, what can we shoot without any fucking money? And I thought, okay, let's do a movie where there's one guy who's a killer and he's in the middle of nowhere and we can shoot that free and there's one girl driving a car and she picks him up uh, and we can do that with two people in the car uh, it seemed like the simplest idea we could come up with um, um, we initially like um, shot it on 16 millimeter and um, then um, all the other crap in my life happened and um, the dust devil script in the 16 millimeter was shunting around various shelves in, in London And, um, yeah, um, when, after I'd finished hardware, I went back to, um, cut the documentary from the footage we'd shot in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And when I went back to the post-production company, which was a company called Cherry Video in London to collect my rushes, I found my rushes had been stolen. In fact, the rushes had all been taken by a Dutch producer named Paul Tribitz. And um, Paul had, um had taken my Afghan footage and um, Paul had also seen a gap in the market that um, Silence the Lambs had just become successful and he thought if we could make a serial killer movie um, maybe you could make some money and he'd gotten his hands on Dust Devil uh, and he said to me um, it, I'll give you back your rushes and you can have your footage provided I sign over the rights to Dust Devil to him And I thought, okay, well, that, that's no contest because Dust Devil's this stupid 16 millimeter movie I tried to make when I was a teenager. 
um, the, the Russians are from the, the Afghan war are immeasurably valuable. So I instantly did that. I, 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 to get my Russians back, I, I signed him the rights and Dust Devil, took my Russians back, made my Afghan documentary, and Paul, in the meantime, set up Dust Devil, which so it, it kind of happened again um, without, um, w without me wanting it to happen. And um, I then found um, <laughs> that I had to yeah, go back to, um, to Namibia. We couldn't go back to South Africa because the apartheid regime was still in charge. And um, shoot this um, nightmarish thing that I'd written when I was 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you're you know, making something, like you said, uh, when you're 15 or 16... And obviously, you have different life experiences and whatnot. Like, how how much did that change from what you originally, you know, had, had written and made? Well, with the the superior technology and uh, at now at my fingertips, I was able to open it out. Mm -hmm. So it um, the movie um, went beyond being a story where um, a lady is driving across the desert and picks up the devil. And um, I was able to, I started opening it out into what um, wanted to be a sort of um, portrayal of the, of the whole country. So um, suddenly I found that, yeah, I was um, building railway stations, getting my hands on steam trains, trying to get my hands on armored cars, and um, yeah, staging um, much larger set pieces. Um, I don't know how true this is, but on IMDb it says the original cut of the the film was like two hours, and then Miramax uh, uh, like cut it down to eighty seven minutes, and that you actually never watched that that version. How how true is all of that? Uh, it's all totally true. <laughs> <laughs> um, this stuff happens every time out. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, every production I've been involved with, and pretty much everything that's happened, has always been uh, really fierce. So that's why I say it's hard to to really enjoy the experience, because one's always fighting. Um, yeah, Dust Devil is totally misunderstood on delivery. I mean, I don't think Harvey and Bob could even understand literally what the people were saying, because they had a hard time with, with the accents, mm -hmm. the, um, South, the, the South African accents, and particularly with the Zakes Mackay character and the John Machikiza characters, um, really, um, yeah, def I think defeated them. Uh, and um, at that time, the British production company that we've been working under, Palace, um, was forced into receivership by um, a larger corporate predator, in this case, Polygram, uh, who themselves have now been, have gone defunct. But yeah, back then they, they ate Palace and took over the company pretty much because they wanted um, control over the, the rights to reservoir dogs, which Palace had at that point. Um, but anyway, Dust Devil got caught in the crossfire. The British parent company was forced into extinction. Um, Miramax took the cutting copy of the film and um, basically made a totally different movie out of it. Um, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, um, it was yeah, edited without me knowing anything about it in the States. And they um, color-coded it a different way. Um, and they tried to make it red to make it look like hardware. And um, they also, um, yeah, pretty much um, Miramax's main light bulb brainwave idea in re editing um, Dust Devil was they pretty much cut out all the black characters and just concentrated on um, Robert and Chelsea. Uh -huh. And yeah, for me, um, Zakes Bakai and John Machikiza were the, the two um, African characters of the film, were already the heroes. So um, yeah, that entire plot line is pretty much gone in um, the American release version. And um, then they got, um, I think, Peter Atkins, like the, was, no, it's Tony Randall from, um, Hell, from Hellbound, the Hellraiser sequel, mm -hmm. to come and um, rewrite ADR for it, to try and, um, yeah, make some sense of it. But no, I, I can't bring myself to watch it. Um, a total mess. And um, then for years, this was um, essentially presented as being Dust Devil, mm -hmm. which um, I figured would, um, would be enough to destroy my career forever. Um, so, um, yeah, faced with, um, being blamed for this atrocity, um, I then had to complete the film and spent the next two, three years, um, getting back the, the rushes, the sound, and the, ultimately getting my hands on the negative and assembling the film and, and, and cut, cutting it properly and then, um, getting it out there. 
I did this with the help of um, Channel 4 Television with, with um, David Orkin, the, who from Channel 4 back then in Britain, who had uh, had money in the production and obviously wanted to see a return on their, on their investment. So um, Channel 4 um, helped me to, um, to finally complete the movie. Um, then once um, the film was actually out there, it at least existed as, um, as proof that um, the Miramax version wasn't it. Uh, that's what's called like the work cut that you can get on DVD. Um, now, now in most territories, you've got the original cut. Mm-hmm. Nope. Oh. Um, Dust Devil still out in Blu- Blu-ray, unfortunately, because it's blocked from being distributed on Blu-ray by MGM of all people, who um, claim Blu-ray rights, but who don't ha- don't have any of the master copies, so can't release it themselves. But um, legally threaten anyone else around the world who um, who, who tried to release it on Blu-ray because um, somehow arcanely because MGM acquired rights from someone else who acquired rights from somewhere else, MGM currently claim they have world um, Blu-ray rights for um, Dust Devil. Wow, it's crazy. Though um... yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Co- corporate raiding which goes on when they break up each other's catalogs and uh, w- uh, when you go 10 or 20 years further down the line it becomes really impenetrable to figure out how people own your movie mm-hmm. it, um, how did Lost Soul like uh, come about like uh, who approached you and uh, were you always like on board to uh, to be part of it no again it was like like pretty much all things in this world it was accidental um Oh, yeah, this, this happened because of that, that goddamn Ouija board, that glow in the dark <laughs> oh, Ouija board from Toys R Us. That's exactly the same one I have. Oh, <laughs> it was the cheapest one I could find, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's because, yeah, that, that told me to make Mother of Toads, right? Oh. Mother of Toads, go make this short movie, oh. which I then, um, yeah, um, David Gregory from Severin was crazy enough to throw 20 grand at it and said, okay, let's, let's do it. And, um, I shot that pretty much here where I'm living in um, in Monstergo. Mm-hmm. And um, then um, when they were re- releasing Theatre Bazaar, um, obviously David wanted to shoot um, some interview material mm-hmm. uh, to um, to support the release and for the um, the commentary tracks, the extras on the, the release. And um, when he was interviewing me, he um, asked, obviously, um, well, what happened on the island of Dr. Moreau and um, well, how come you ended up living here in this quasi-medieval environment? Mm-hmm. And, um, I, and I told him, I, I gave him a brief Moreau interview. I mean, I, 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 I so probably circled around the main facts because I'm still very um, wary of getting sued. Mm-hmm. But um, at that point, I gave him the interview for... Um, for um th- yeah the support of um theater bazaar then um david obviously liked the interview so much that um in the end he decided he wouldn't use it just as an extra on um the theater bazaar release mm-hmm. but he started developing it thinking maybe he would put it up as a blog or um put it on the Fe- the, the, Se- the severin film site uh, and he started searching out more people involved in the story also because like so many things he couldn't really believe it the um, story was so far-fetched that he had to um, go and um, find other eyewitnesses uh, and um, find a few other people who'd been there to, um, before um, he could tell whether I was actually um, on the money. And, um, yeah, the basic um, <coughs> ending up being a dog on the island of Dr. Moreau's story, I guess, caught his interest. But I didn't know David was doing it. He um, took it took about two years uh, to um, track all those people down, and um, I didn't see a frame of it. It had no input in, on the edit. Mm-hmm. Um, then eventually he, um, yeah, he um, sent me a Vimeo of the thing, and I recall watching it for the first time, and um, I was just yeah hunched over my computer screen, yeah, on my own up here in the mountains. And I think at the end of that first viewing experience, the um, the main note that I had written on the pad next to the um, the keyboard was um, "call lawyer," underlined a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> so initially, I was very frightened. <laughs> oh, right, right. 
So uh, did did they had did uh, did they have to cut anything out? Uh, did once you called the lawyer? Um, no, I didn't. I didn't actually have a lawyer, but um, I didn't think fuck. I'm going to get um, sued by um, Time Warner, uh-huh. <laughs> Time Warner, the parent company of New Line. Uh, and, uh, pretty much everyone on Moreau's pretty much had to sign a gag order. Mm-hmm. So. Um, yeah, breaking the silence on it did worry me. And, um, yeah, it was a depressing story. But um, the difference was that eventually I saw it with an audience. I finally sh- saw it with some other people. And um, at the point when I saw it with other people in the room, I realized that um, other people were laughing. Not only were they laughing, they, they were laughing a lot. Um, the bigger the audience, the, the bigger the laughs we were getting. And um, by the time it came all the way through to, um, yeah, Nelson De La Rosa, the, the shortest man on earth, um, punching Marco Hofschneider, the, um, the German actor from Europa Europa and the nuts, and um, me having to dress up as a dog and things, the, we were getting really big laughs. In fact, they're the biggest laughs to any movie I've been involved in has gotten. So I thought, damn, this works as comedy. I, I, I hadn't seen it coming because I was too involved in the reality of the thing, but I realized that Lost Soul was funny. And then for some sequences, genuinely funny. And um, that, that, that made me um, a lot less apprehensive. Mm-hmm. I figured that if we can take this um, deeply unfortunate experience and it could end up being so rich and entertaining to the, uh, to the general audience, then um, it, it can't be all bad. Um, uh, for you though, was it like hard to, to revisit the story, you know, to talk about it and then, and then to see it and, and everyone talking about it before you realized, you know, that people, you know, enjoyed it on a different level? Um, well, I think it's been useful in that at least it's, it's, it's fairly close to the truth. Mm-hmm. And that's, I'd say it's like 60% of the actual truth of what happened. So um, it has helped uh, establish um, the reality of the events because um, in the absence of a, um, a confession or um, something telling the truth about Moreau, all kinds of insane stories had spread. Uh, everyone liked to believe that um, me and Marlon Brando had gone completely insane in the tropics and um, people were largely unaware of um, just how um, corporate the whole thing was. Uh, and how much of um, the Moreau experience was really a um, a kind of corporate power game. So um, it was nice also that people were, were um, generally made aware that once again the movie that got made, the Frankenheimer film, was in no ways the, um, the film I'd intended. I mean, it was nice to be able to set the record straight in that. Yeah, I, I watched Lost Soul actually last year. Uh, I was in the hospital for several months. I almost died and stuff. And so I, was, I actually watched a lot of documentaries. And that was one I watched. And uh, uh, I think part, I, I, I mean, some of it is funny, like you just said. I think actually second time I watched it, I, I found it more funny. But I, I do find a lot of it like, uh, it's like heartbreaking. It's uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Lost in, in La Mancha, the documentary about um, the TV yeah, I have, yeah. Uh, it's the Terry Gilliam movie that didn't get made, but it's the same kind of thing. It's like uh, someone who's so passionate about something, and then it, you know it all falls apart. Uh, you know, for that person anyway. Yeah, I was kind of destined to um to do so. I mean, I think Moreau is ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. I mean, had um, they been making Moreau now, um, the movie I think would have been understood a lot better. I mean, New Line's mistake throughout was imagining that, um, and this comes across to me very clearly when I'm watching Lost Soul, was to think that the film was all about um, Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer, uh, and about the, um, the superstars are connected to the movie, and their constant confusion as to what the fuck it is I'm doing with spending all my time with these little drawings and with these animals and these things. They never seemed to understand that the animals were, the creatures were the leads. The, it, it, now in the post um, Guardians of the Galaxy, post um, Planet of the Apes um, ecology, people would more clearly understand that yeah, Val playing the the mad scientist's research assistant, it was not the um, the main point of the movie. 
that um, the Beast People were the main point of the movie, which was something which got yeah, utterly lost. Um, yeah, li literally nobody involved in that film seemed to understand um, what the Beast People were there for. And um, then Frankenheim was brought on board because they see him as a troubleshooter who can deal with the superstar egos. But once again, Frankenheim has got no interest in the monsters. And um, it's completely looking the other way. Nobody's supervising the makeup effects people. The, the creatures are kind of this thing which, is, which no one is dealing with. And um, yeah, I think that was a, a, a running misapprehension uh, um, throughout the production. All, all the uh, all the artwork is like is very dark and bizarre, and uh, you know, uh, seeing all that in the in in the movie, I was like, you know, wow, I really wish you know uh, this would have you know happened. But uh, how did you get involved with uh, Graham Humphreys? Because his his work's great, and uh, we've had him on the show before. Yeah, I love Graham. I mean, Graham was one of the, the one of the big inspirations on hardware. I mean, I think I just got involved with Graham because I loved his work. And um, from the time of the Evil Dead poster, or it was probably the the raging chimpanzee with the um, with the, the switchblade on the Creepers poster that really sold me. And um, yeah, Graham was press ganged into storyboarding hardware, um, designing hardware, and um, drew thousands of drawings for it, which I'm still got in um, folders all over the place. Mm -hmm. So it was in the same on Dust Devil. So it was natural that um, when we came to Moreau, we went through the same process and we simply started drawing Moreau. Uh, and there's a huge amount, number of, yeah, Graham Humphrey's storyboard panels, which um, most folk haven't seen. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that. That's, that's pretty sweet. Well, what is it about? I know you, yeah, you, I still you, hope, you go on, sorry. I still hope that we might be able to reconstitute the movie somehow. And I wish that someone would um, do it as a comic book. Or um, there'd be some way to um, try to, um, yeah, reassemble a facsimile of the original film. Uh, I know they, they referenced the Marvel comics in the documentary. Um, I, I, I never read those, but what did you think of those? Um, well, I, okay, I'm, I'm not a fan of really of anything that's been done so far with, uh, with Dr. Moreau. Besides just the original book, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think it's. I don't. I, I think um, the island of Doctor Moreau almost remains virginal, in that um, I, I I can't recommend any existing um, uh, adaptation of it. Uh, yeah. It's proved to be, proved to be one of those books that a little bit like Heart of Darkness that's super hard to um, to convey. And um, yeah, it's certain, uh, there's definitely life in there. And um, I think that um, inherent within H.G. Wells' original idea, uh, a bunch of things which are hugely problematic for um, really for show business and for the, 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 the corporate ecology. Everyone loves the idea of, of humanized animals, mm -hmm. as in the, yeah, the, say, in Guardians of the Galaxy, the raccoon or... Um, the people have got no problem with nowadays with, um, with, with humanized animals. But it's the problem of um, human beings being also animals, uh, and um, the problem of the there being no um, distinction necessarily between yeah the people and the beasts. They've all plainly got souls. They're just at different sort of points in the evolutionary spectrum, uh, that, which, which kind of runs counter to um, orthodox Christianity in a, in a whole bunch of ways. So we're still in a world where people um, don't like to believe in evolution. And um, I think it's that um, cross-blending of the human and animal in Moreau that takes it to a place beyond Planet of the Apes, where it's just slightly too goddamn offensive for anyone to want, anyone to, want to go there. Uh, the, um, I, I'd put into the script a human-animal relationship story, too, where um, the, there was a love story between um, the castaway and one of the beast people, which also um, continues to worry people. Uh, it's um, it's a a tricky area of the story, but it's very, you know it has the potential to be a um, an insane blend of um, say Planet of the Apes, Jurassic Park, and um, Doctor Doolittle, <laughs> but um, it has yet to be realised in a manner which I think um, yeah could <laughs> conveys um, the island the way that that, that I would imagine it. Mm -hmm. I mean. Part of this is also that Moreau is not a, a bad guy. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Moreau is tr trying to do something essentially fairly noble. He's trying to create a utopian society with uh, where um, even meat eating if, um, is um, criminalized. Um, the, all the beast people are compulsive vegetarians and, and, and pacifists. He, his, um, his aims are, um, are very high-minded. He's not a, um, a sadist like Charles Lawton portrays him in um, Isle of Lost Souls. But uh, the results are, are an abomination. So yeah, that too is a, a is something that I, I don't think they they like to convey. It's much easier for them to see Moreau as a mad scientist or evil, uh, and who creates evil and is then is punished. It's much harder to understand that they they're trying to do something which is essentially um, <laughs> nobly intended, but um, like all things, it, it's doomed to um, to devolve into an inferno. So, um, which flies against, the, I think, um, the way that America sees the world. I mean, they like to believe that if they overthrow the tyrants and um, introduce democracy to the beast people, that it should be a triumphant ending and a happy fade out, and um, it should be nice and simple. So, I think there's things in the Wells book that um, stick in the the corporate system in different ways. They want it because they can see how the dog people um, could be great on screen and um, it could it could be very lovable and funny and and, and, and sad and we haven't really seen dog men and, 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 and cat women to that extent yet on, in a movie. So that some aspects of it are very um, commercial, but some other aspects of it um, seem to attack yeah, Christianity, the American dream, um, our, our notion of progress, um, our notion of humanity. Uh, good and evil, etc. And this is all thanks to Wells being a, a genius at the beginning and actually um, raising cogent questions. So it's it's a problematic beast, Moreau. It's harder to adapt than people think. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I know you go over it in the. Uh, well, you just kind of went over it here, but uh, how old were you when you when you discovered uh, the book and the. the uh, did your views on it change over time, or uh, you know, because I think sometimes if you read something when you're younger, then you read it when you're older, you see different things, you know, different things uh, affect you or interest you, you know, over time. Yeah, I guess um, I, well, I came into it very young. Again, it was a gift from my dad. Um, it was one of my dad's books, and very nicely in the bookshelf was a uh, when I was literally four, five, six years old, there was this bright red book, um, which was a colonial first edition of H.G. Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau. It had one plate in the beginning showing um, the castaway spying on the beast people. Mm -hmm. And it was really from every man's colonial library. It was right back from the end of the 19th century. And somehow this little colonial Moreau had ended up in um, Cape Town, South Africa, uh, and it was red, so I probably got it down as a child simply because it was a bright color. Uh, and um, then the plate showing the man spying on these creatures in the jungle clearing, um, the one drawing, put the hook in me as a four-year-old or a five-year-old before I could read it. And then the next thing was that the adults all said, oh, don't read that. That's much too, <clears throat> much too frightening. That's much too adult. You can't, you can't read that one. And they would then take the book out of my hands again, which made me even more keen to get my hands on it and to find out what was in that red book. And, um, yeah, then um, obviously I read it as soon as I could, probably within a, um, a year or so of them first pulling it out of my hands. And um, then I went to see the, um, the AIP movie with um, Burt Lancaster and Michael York, which came out somewhere around about then, in the, this being the 1970s, and, um, which I remember I liking, the, liking the poster, and being exciting, excited to see the movie, uh -huh. and because I was in love with the book, um, I remember the um, the crashing sense of disappointment, and uh, um, rage that came over me as a child at what they had done to the material. Uh -huh. It was a similar feeling to watching. Um, I recall feeling the same way when I saw the Dino De Laurentiis King Kong remake as a child, and Seven. having fallen in love with the original Kong. Um, yeah, I, I, I was so angry that um, I, I put the idea in me that um, somebody needs to do a better job. Mm -hmm. And I said, this, someone has to actually tell the story. So um, the, yeah, the thought um, 
I guess, was planted when I was young and from reading the book, it had tumbled around in my head for um, for years and years and um, came out really um, naturally as an adult. Unfortunately, as we've not ma- been able to make the movie, I guess it'll it'll remain in my head. Mm-hmm. Did, did you ever uh, watch... Uh watch the movie Island of Dr. Moreau so, in pieces mm-hmm. um, there was a contractual obligation screening <laughs> okay <laughs> I was contractually obliged to see it they were contractually obliged to show it to me uh, I didn't want to see it they didn't want to show it to me yeah. but we had to <laughs> <laughs> Did, were you like in like Clockwork or Orange or you just had your eyes pried open no, but I was surrounded by there was no. It was a preview theater and some. It was some horrible like um, yeah, Time Warner preview theater in London, uh-huh. and um, I was the only real human being in there. Um, everyone else in the preview theater were lawyers and agents and people who were watching to see to make sure that everything was done according to the letter of the law. <laughs> and that um, I duly watched it and then I I duly signed off on it, and, um, which I had to do in order to. Um, yeah, claim any monies for the movie. Mm-hmm. That must not. That must not have been a good experience. I would assume. No, nah, like most of it, it was painful. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't a completed version either. It was missing um, a chunk, a bunch of different scenes where there was scene missing cards, and none of the CG work had been done. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, I didn't really count as um, seeing it from end to end. Um, what did occur to me though was I was amazed that it actually um, even resembled a movie. Uh, I was amazed that sequences were, had cut together, mm-hmm. uh, um, that some pieces of it sort of worked, mm-hmm. because um, the ex- the shooting experience was so chaotic that um, I literally thought that they that the continuity would be such a problem that they wouldn't be able to um, to cut some of those individual scenes together. Mm-hmm. Like I recall a point where David Thewlis decided to um, well it was Brando's idea. Brando. Brando um, um, gave Thulis the advice to go into work with one half of his moustache shaved off just to see if anyone would notice. <laughs> <laughs> but there was an awful lot of that kind of shit going on in the set, uh-huh. which is why I was, um, yeah, I was amazed that it, that it had even gotten something that was movie-shaped on screen. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you can answer this, but do you think if uh, you were, uh, if you did direct it, that Brando would have still done all those things, or...? You think he would have behaved a little more? Or? Yeah, I don't think Brando was the problem. Mm-hmm. I mean, Brando was never was never anything but um, courteous to me, mm-hmm. and um, was very nice to all the Beast people too. Mm-hmm. And, um, the do- the documentary makes note of this that he was yeah. um, friendly to um, the extras and to the yeah the Beast folk and to the Aboriginals, but um, was a um, a pain in the ass for the people in charge, uh, and for um, and had no time at all for Val. But um, throughout, I mean, the problem for me was that um, we had the you know, Val was the ninety-pound gorilla in the actual um, shooting, and um, yeah, the the problem always came back to the fact that New Line perceived it as a um, a Brando Val Kilmer movie, uh, as such, were always going to do whatever Val asked. And um, if if we had had a production that had been able to um, say no, or at least understand that, I mean, uh, the analogy I was making earlier would be very similar if you were making, say, um, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and the people making it had become obsessed by the fact that it was a Gary Oldman movie. Mm-hmm. Yes, Gary Oldman's in the movie, right. and he's got a small part, uh-huh. but actually there's this ape called Caesar, who is the real character. And uh, um, if we had had a, um, a production who were genuinely behind the movie and who weren't just keen to um, make certain that um, the stars were happy, uh, I, th- I think we would have been okay. But, um, yeah, throughout that, we, uh, they were never making a Richard Stanley movie. So um, whatever I wanted to do was always going to be, um, yeah, thrown to the four winds. Plus, um, you, I, re- I was too young and stupid to realize you couldn't make an R-rated movie for that kind of money anyway. They were always going to have problems with that stuff. You can't really hope to make an adult movie 
or a film which um, deals with adult themes and has adult levels of um, sex and violence and language in it, um, once you go over um, like $25 million. And I think Moreau went all the way up to about $75 million. The whole thing was always going to turn into Stargate, always going to turn into some kind of, um, you know, gonzo um, yeah, Star Trek or Doctor Who episode, whether I liked it or not. Uh, do you think that's changed at all, or do you think that's still uh, still the way it would be? No, it's getting even worse. Uh-huh. Um, I have do a lot of screen screenwriting these days, which is my um, principal income. Um, and what I'm noticing in the last twelve months or so is a very is the 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 Chinese box office is now having an effect on what you can do above a certain budget level. Mm-hmm. I mean. Um, China is now um, the largest um, slice of the um, the box office take. So um, above a certain budget, you have to be able to have a film which you can distribute in China. Um, this started to become an issue after um, the Ghostbusters reboot was um, banned in China this year, mm-hmm. um, which was a big blow to the, the Ghostbusters people. Um, Star Wars managed to sneak in. Uh, this is because um, China has strict laws now against um, the portrayal of the supernatural on film. You um, can't have ghosts. Uh, and um, You can't have a spiritual or a supernatural element in the film if it's going to um, play in China. Um, so I've found that, I, that a lot of the stuff that I've been working on, um, I'm, notes are coming back to me literally like... Um, Remove um, Jesus fucking Christ, remove I'll be God fucking damned, remove um, just regular swear words, but it's coming back, don't mention Jesus. You take Christ out. Um, there's an issue with, with um, religion and um, yeah, supernatural material above a certain budgetary level, which um, yeah, it does feel like a form of, um, of mass censorship. Essentially, there's, there's now, as a result, themes that we cannot deal with above a, um, a certain box office level, not just adult themes, but um, spiritual themes, which um, basically, yeah, it's it just becoming no-go areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know um, just like uh, the Mandarin character in the Iron, one of the Iron Man movies, they, uh, they changed him so he wasn't, you know, Chinese, because uh, he was the villain and they didn't want to offend uh, the Chinese um, moviegoers. Yeah, no, it's going to be more of a problem because I'm, yeah, I've got no issue really with in terms of um, yeah, not, um, not portraying Asians in an evil light. I've got no real desire to do so, although I wish someone would make a new Fu Manchu movie because I kind of miss Fu Manchu. It's been gone a long time. Uh, <laughs> but um, apart from that, um, yeah, they, they have passed draconian censorship laws against, yeah, both the portrayal of um, the supernatural and um, the other thing that hasn't nobody's said anything about yet is that they've, they're really down on the positive portrayal of gay relationships. Oh. Ditto, ditto scenes where crime is seen to pay. Mm-hmm. But um, the gay relationship thing, no one's really mentioned yet because I can see that's going to be a problem unless, um, yeah, they find some... Um, some way of mitigating against it, but right now U.S.-Chinese relationships r- relations are so f- so tense in the post-Trump world that they may lose that chunk of the box office anyway, and the ecology may change. Let's let's see what happens. But um, yeah, it, it definitely feels that once you go over a certain budget level, in any kind of number of ways, there's some um, people who are um, essentially putting a bandaid over your mouth. There you um, there's themes you can't use. There's some um, words you can't say. And um, a whole bunch of different, yeah, no-go areas, which we, yeah, we literally can't, um, we can't touch in high-budget um, genre movies. Mm-hmm. As someone, um, uh, sci- yeah, go on, sorry. I was going to say, science fiction as a result is always lagging behind real life, which sucks. It's like that Mexican border wall thing earlier on. I've been wanting to put a Mexican border wall in a science fiction movie for twenty years. But uh, now we're going to get one in real life, but we're still um it's still too controversial to to somehow mention it in the sci fi film which um yeah sucks yeah because I think sci fi traditionally has been uh a place to talk about social uh you know social things you know in the guise of of uh of science fiction going back to like Twilight Zone and star trek and... yeah exactly um this is what makes it so galling 
um, was that you would wish that um, yeah, science, cinema science fiction could be smarter. Now, as someone uh, not living in the U.S. and you know looking in, um, what are your thoughts of Trump as uh, as president, and how does that affect the whole world? Gosh, well, it's too early to say. <laughs> well, um, it nerdy. seems to me that so, that somehow the tone of language and the tone of what's happened has opened up a. Um, a trap door in the back of everyone's minds, uh, which has allowed the alligators out. Because um, I'm amazed at what people now think is socially acceptable. I mean, we're hearing levels of language and racism and casual racism in day-to-day -day conversations and on Facebook feeds that would have been um, completely um, out of the question five years ago. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm amazed at how ugly it's become. And I think that's partially because um, Trump has kind of normalized that kind of discourse. Mm -hmm. So um, now it's no, no worries when I'm opening up Facebook and seeing people saying things about we need to you know, get rid of the Jews, we need to get rid of the Muslims, etc. And I'm saying, what the fuck are you saying? Um, there's just so much of that going around in America, in England, in France, that um, yeah, I'm distressed at, um, at how this, um, the ascendancy of the Trump regime has... Um, revealed a um the racism and and ugliness in um western society at the moment uh, it's it's uh, it almost feels like an an epidemic of um some kind of psychoactive virus like um an an epidemic of intolerance is um sweeping through the the west uh, and with it is total distrust everyone is saying get rid of the foreigners mm -hmm. and um everyone is everyone else's foreigner i'm a foreigner I'm a, a foreigner in France. I'm a, I, I, if I'm in America, I'm I'm also a, a, a foreigner, and um, and I, I, I'm getting this feeling, yeah, pretty much wherever I am. I mean, as for Trump, I got no clue yet um, where this is going. He feels like um, a dictator from a um, '70s sci-fi novel, particularly close, I think, to Ferris Fremont in. Um, Philip K. Dick's Radio Free Albemuth. Um, in Radio Free Albemuth, Ferris Fremont also turns out to be a front for Russia, which is why I think it's, it's super close. I mean, I'm like most people in the West, I'm scared of Putin. Um, I have the sensation that um, the, the, the whole of the European Union is now starting to look super shaky uh, and is becoming um, increasingly destabilized. And that's yeah, partly because of the um, the millions of um, of Syrians heading north, which is partly because um, of um, Russia um, bombing the the hell out of Syria, and, um, and of course bombing um, not ISIS but bombing ISIS's opponents mm -hmm. um, for reasons that I can scarcely begin to understand, other than the fact that it's given them a, a warm water port. And yeah, now I'm Trump saber rattling of the Chinese. So, Lord only knows where it's going to go. It's a, a super scary time, and it, it feels like, um, yeah, like the 1930s all over again. I mean, um, the biggest disaster would be if um, the far right um, under Le Pen um, triumphs here in France, and France decides to leave the EU too. In which case, um, I think we'll see the complete breakup of the um, the European Union. And a complete a return to um, yeah to to far right nationalism, and um, so yeah it's a, a a freaky time, and I I suspect that there's no way you can go down that route without it heading towards some kind of war. Yep, I I couldn't agree more. It's a very scary time, and uh, it it and uh, about the Facebook thing, like uh, uh, I never expected. So many people I know uh, would say those th things you're saying that you know basically like you know very bigotry, uh, uh, bigoted things and then hateful things about people. And I think it kind of started actually when uh, the gay rights passed. I started to see like so many people uh, gay marriage passed here. So many people say uh, you know such uh, horrible things about uh, gay people. And I was like, I I really yeah. don't think like my friends. You know, I only thought like people for me where I live. I live in Massachusetts. It's very liberal. And no one really cares, and so I only thought maybe like someone like from s some small kind of hick town would would think like that. But it, there's a lot more people th than I realize. 
Yeah, it's very crazy. It feels like um, the sort of liberal democracy that we're used to is, is kind of dying. Uh, and, um, the um, the original liberal culture I thought I was part of is, is, is yeah, kind of um, deeply under threat. I mean, I've been noticing that, um, yeah, that goth culture seems to be f sort of failing in the States. I'm very sorry that um, Fangoria magazine ceased publication. And, um, yeah, I'm seeing a sort of a, a great dying of the uh, uh, of a big part of the um, liberal scene that I was part of. And um, I don't know what's coming, but it's some, this um, drift towards the right does feel... Um, or, or almost willfully insane. I mean, it's almost like folk are so tired that they just want to blow everything up just to see what happens. It's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a scary time, as we said. Um, so, uh, uh, you said about uh, script writing. Uh, what's some of the stuff out there that uh, people could see that you've written? Well, I've got one coming this year, which is Replace. Mm-hmm. Um, which is one of the first movies in a while to be actually adapted from one of my screenplays. So um, it actually somehow made it all the way through the, um, the different obstructions placed between um, <laughs> the keyboard and um, the screen. Um, replaces a, um, a sci-fi um, sci -fi horror movie mm -hmm. um, set in the near future dealing with um, the outer limits of gene therapy with the ability to stay young longer through um, by stopping one's body from, from aging. So I guess it's an entry, an entry in the, um, yeah, the, the wasp woman um, rejuvenation stakes, and it's also on some level a story of vampirism. Um, low budget, and um, yeah, shot in Canada and Germany by um, Norbert Kiel, who is a... Um, a first-time director, an extremely talented guy who's come up through um, through trailers and commercials, and this is his first feature film. And um, I'm pleased to say he shot the hell out of it, and it's got some nice performances in there too. So um, I'm happy with the um, the way replacements come together. Oh, cool. I mean, until someone is prepared to um, give me back the um, the keys to the toy box, the only real way of getting anything done right now is um, doing things by proxy. So, um, yeah, I'm writing like crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara Crampton's also in Replace, which is very cool. Yeah, no, good value. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I've already written a, a follow-up for Norbert, so I'm hoping oh, that cool. Replace does well so we can make the next one. Mm -hmm. Because, um, yeah, I'm very, very happy with the, um, the second script that I've written for Norbert. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to direct again? Yeah, always trying. Always trying to find a way. Um, been developing an adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's The Color Out of Space for the last few years, mm -hmm. which um, I'd very much like to get made. Been wanting to make a Lovecraft movie a long, long time. Um, it, of course, like everything I work on, everything I love, um, it has inherent problems. In this case, the, um, the downbeat nature of the material. Mm -hmm. the, um, it's a Lovecraft story. So um, the... Um, it's inevitable that it leads to yeah madness, um, <laughs> degeneration, and death, and uh, some ending of um, stark, screaming cosmic horror. It doesn't want to um, go to a um, positive, happy ending or a, a reassuring place. Uh -huh. And um, none of the characters have um, positive arcs in um, a normal Hollywood casting way. Most of the characters in the story are hopelessly overwhelmed by the circumstances, unravel, go mad, and either are destroyed or become a danger to the other characters. But they don't react in ways in the script which are Hollywood-friendly. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, these have been an obstacle to getting the film made. But um, at the same time, um, the strength of the design work and the, um, the sheer scariness of the screenplay and the material, I think, um, speaks for itself. So um, I'm still hoping that... Um, Color will find its way through. It's currently being developed by um, Elijah Wood's company, Spectavision, oh. who are yeah, putting a lot of energy into it. Mm -hmm. So I um, would love to see that happen. Yeah. You mentioned Lovecraft a couple times. Um, uh, is there, do you like any of the adaptations to film so far of, uh, of any Lovecraft works? 
Well, Lovecraft's another one. There's guys like H.G. Wells, which have been extremely problematic in translating for to, <laughs> to uh -huh. screen. Um, I do like Stuart Gordon's work. I uh, enjoy his films very much, but I feel they function better on, as black comedy mm -hmm. the, than actual horror movies. I mean, I find Reanimator very funny. Uh, uh, yeah. I enjoyed Dagon. I'm, I'm actually in Dagon. I play one of the fish people. Oh, really? Um, that yeah. <laughs> I'm identifiable by the hat. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, particularly visible in the scene where Ezra Godden is trying to hotwire the car. Uh -huh. But uh, and, uh, I also really love um, Stuart's episode of Masters of Horror. I like um, Dreams in the Witch House. Mm -hmm. I think he did an awesome job with Brown Jenkin. And I, I love the bit in that show where um, the rat first comes up and whispers in Ezra Godden's ear. Psst, oh. hey, hey. Um, very trippy. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, I still think Stuart's work's um, essentially funny. It essentially run, works as a black comedy. And um, I don't think that's what Lovecraft himself intended. Mm -hmm. And um, some part of me has always wanted to um, see the Lovecraft movie that um, would have happened if, say, um, Stanley Kubrick or um, Ingmar Bergman or um, Andrei Tarkovsky or someone had gotten into it instead. Mm -hmm. um, something which um, would deal with the, um, the central theme of, um, of cosmic horror and um, the overpowering insignificance of man's place in the universe and our inability to, um, to influence or um, <laughs> really change the, the events around us. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, when I, when I worked on Color, I really set about it to try and um, create something scary. I wanted Lovecraft to be, um, to be terrifying again. And I don't feel any of the existing adaptations, honestly, are scary. And nor do I feel that I've ever actually made a, a particularly scary movie myself. Hardware's a, um, got horror elements, but it's also a sci-fi movie and doesn't exist just to scare the audience. And um, Dust Devil's a, a mutant of um, road movie, romance, um, African Western police procedural. There's so many generic elements in there that, it, again, it isn't just trying to single-handedly scare, undermine and terrify the audience. So um, with colour, I really would like to make a, a genuinely scary movie um, just once in my life. So um, although there's yeah elements of humour in there, it's... It's a different, a different take from where Stuart's gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you have to go outside of Lovecraft to find films which are truly Lovecraftian. Like, um, I would nominate John Carpenter's The Thing mm. as being um, almost a Lovecraft movie. Uh -huh. It's got um, strong, strong Lovecraft elements, but it's from yeah, John W. Campbell's um, original um, Who Goes There, which um, itself is a, a knockoff of At the Mountains of Madness, the Lovecraft story that... Um, appeared pretty much the year before in the 1930s. So The Thing does have um, yeah, a strong tranche of Lovecraftiana. Mm -hmm. um, no, yeah, there's elements of it in, um, say, Andrei Zalorsky's Possession with Isabella Jani and Sam, Sam Neill's also distinctly Lovecraftian, while not being a, um, an actual Lovecraft adaptation. Um, what is, um, we mentioned the, the movies that, that you liked as a kid, but w what are some of your favorite horror movies? Yeah, it's a tricky thing. I mean, the uh, my favorite films are mostly films that make me feel better about my life, or which I go back to and rewatch. Mm -hmm. They're generally not the best films, or the films that, are the, that were the scariest and the most technically excellent. Mm -hmm. But my favorite ones are the ones that I I, I, I rewatch the most often. So, um, in that list, I, I I mean, I'm, for instance, I'm I, I love and adore Phantasm, the nice. Don Coscarelli movie. I saw Phantasm when I was a 13-year-old, mm -hmm. right at the time when I was climbing over graveyard fences at night and um, climbing trees and getting up to no good. And um, the original Phantasm absolutely yeah, captured the same vibe as I get from um, the Ray Bradbury books from um, Something Wicked This Way Comes and um, Dandelion Wine and things. So, yeah, I've always adored Don's work. And, um, yeah, I've followed... Um, Don Coscarelli's career from <laughs> that point onwards. Uh -huh. Big Bubba Hotep uh, fan as well. Just, I was just going to mention, I love Bubba Hotep, yeah. Uh, did you yeah, I love Bubba. Yeah. <laughs> did, 
I, I was always they always talk about making the sequel Bubba Nosferatu, and I hope that happens at some point. But uh, did you see uh, Phantasm Ravager, the uh, the final Phantasm? No, I haven't dared yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm I'm an original Phantasm fan, but uh, I've also been scared at the way that the um the franchise has gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually really liked the fifth one though. For, for my, I like the, okay. the first one and the, and the last one the best. I'm so glad you said that because you're one of the first people to say something positive about it. Uh-huh. So um, that yeah, um, restores people, my faith. Yeah, a lot of people, <laughs> I was really rooting for it before it came out. Uh-huh. And then the moment all the reviews happened, I went, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't like it, but uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. So I don't necessarily go by what other people say, but uh, I, I, I dug it. Yeah, I was absolutely dev- devastated when Angus died. Yeah. And him and we lost him and Christopher Lee around quite close together and. And I've seen Knocked Me for Six. I mean, Angus was always my image of Uncle Creepy from the Creepy comics. I read those comics when I was young. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, just absolutely presses all the right buttons for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of my our favorite uh, interviews, Annabelle and I, we we uh, interviewed uh, Angus in person at uh, at a convention, and it was a little bit before he passed away. And it's it's very bittersweet because he knows he knew during the interview he he didn't have much longer. But uh, he really talks about being happy with uh, all that he's done, and it kind of sounds depressing if if you hear that. But if you listen to it, like it's actually uplifting, and it's kind of like, you know, you kind of wish like when your time comes, you have the same attitude. And it's one of the sweetest, nicest people I've ever met. Yeah, um, always been a fan. <clears throat> yeah, and on that subject of horror movies, I like. I'm also a big fan of Italian horror movies. Always have been. Mm-hmm. Any in particular? From back in the day. Uh, any in particular? Um, well, I, I, I was fanatical about Argento back when Argento was still making great movies. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, from Four Flies and Grey Velvet through um, Deep Red, um, Suspiria, um, Inferno, um, Tenebrae, you could really do no wrong. And um, kind of like bits of um, phenomena and opera. And then I kind of pretty much fucking hate everything I ever did after that. And it all feels like a complete betrayal of everything I believed in. <laughs> but um, in, in, in the middle of uh, Argento's career, there are some films that I absolutely adore. Uh, um, I love some of the Bava movies too. Um, <clears throat> i particularly keen on a film called Lisa and the Devil by Mario Bava with Telly Savalas. And... Um, yeah, I think the other the other two barbers I love are um, Kill Baby Kill and um, yeah, the Whip in the Flesh or the Whip in the Body, both of which are so beautifully shot and lit. Mm-hmm. And I just yeah, I just enjoy the colours as much as anything. Mm-hmm. And um, then Fulci, obviously, mm-hmm. um, and it's just impossible to uh, ignore the <laughs> that brace of movies he made around 1980. Uh-huh. I mean, um, the Beyond and. Um, City of the Living Dead and Zombie Flesh Eaters and um, yeah, House by the Cemetery have been giving me so much fun over the years. Mm-hmm. Different midnight screenings. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, you mentioned uh, Dario Argento and his newer film. Uh, did you ever see his Dracula movie? And if you have, oh god, I did. Yeah, I did. I, I, uh, I'm still loyal. Uh, uh, I'm. St- I'm st- Still, his number one fan, but uh, I have to see his work when it comes out. But God, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's just nothing in that one. No, no, no. It, I mean, it, it was. I feel bad saying that because he's, uh, you know, a huge uh, director. But it was. It was. It's actually. I actually laugh while watching. It's laughably bad. It's not. I couldn't even laugh this time. I mean, at least like some of the previous ones, Mother of Mother of Tears got laughs out of me. Uh huh. Like. I, I adore it when um, Asia in Mother of Tears jumps on the train and says, how far is this train going? And the, the train guard says, the train will leave in half an hour. And it's like some of the dialogue in that one still makes not enough sense that I'm able to laugh. But yeah, Dracula, I just I felt like watching paint dry. I was thinking, how does he have all these great people? The, even Rutger Hauer is giving a bad performance. Mm-hmm. Mm, but, um, you know, the the Simonetti score doesn't work. And um, Asia gets her tits out again. She's, she, it's not really hot. And, and none of it really works. Uh, I, yeah, I, I couldn't, can't understand what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there any uh, recent uh, horror movies that you enjoy? 
Yeah, I mean, I think on the whole, um, the last couple of years, things have been getting slightly better on the low-budget horror end. Mm-hmm. We've been seeing some good things. I mean, um, out of the last year, I, I, at a at a, 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 a sort of glance, I would single out um, Baskin by Count Jan Everall from yeah. Turkey. I was going to mention that. That's like my favorite uh, horror movie of recent years. It was fantastic. Yeah, Baskin rocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really like that. And Jan's a good guy and yeah, yeah. one to watch. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, um, that's an honest to God Lovecraftian movie. Mm-hmm. And Jean, Jean's a secret Lovecraft fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we had him on uh, the show with uh, and Mehmet, who plays uh, the father in the movie, and uh, who that was a great performance uh, I thought by him, and he was never an actor before. He plays like yeah, kind of I mean, kind of, mm-hmm. uh, that was one of the real strokes of genius in that movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe he was a parking lot attendant. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really wild and, yeah, story. It's, it's, oops, you go. I was just saying, it's a really wild story about about him himself, Mehmet. Yeah, in- incredible. So, yeah, I absolutely love Baskin. Mm-hmm. And I um, really want to see um, a lot more from Jean. Mm-hmm. And um, super glad it worked out as well as it did. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, also from last year, I guess I would throw in um, Bone Tomahawk. Um, yeah, um, the witch into the bag as well. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, so, how can people uh, find you uh, if they'd like to follow you? Like, not like. Um, easy to find on Facebook. Uh-huh. I've got like a. I guess it's pretty oversubscribed. I've got a pretty heavily subscribed public Facebook page, and um, but I tend to keep an eye on it and. Um, I've got a, I've got like a secret Facebook page which um, I let people onto only when I can figure out they're not maniacs. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> which is hard to figure out sometimes on the Facebook. Yeah, it takes a few years. There's <laughs> got to be a Fight Club kind of um, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> wait on the doorstep for four or five years. Maybe we'll let you in. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, one other question was uh, in 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 um, in Lost Soul. You mentioned that your that your mom was into witchcraft and. Uh, can you explain, like, uh, explain that and, like, what that was like to grow up with? I'm pretty awesome. I mean, yeah, my, basically my mom was, um, was English. She came out of the West Country. So she always had a big passion for fairy stories and for, um, little people, for, um, folklore. And when she went to Africa, she went to Africa at the end of, um, World War II during the austerity. Um, I believe she went to Bulawayo and what was then Rhodesia, because it had the word away in it. And it just seemed like a, a hell of a ways from where she, wa- where she was. She um, took those interests with her. So um, for a white um, colonial settler, um, she had an unusual interest in, um, in folk traditions, in um, mythological creatures, in um, invisible beings, little people that lived in riverbeds, and um, was was it was fascinated by things that the other white folk um didn't ask about uh, and, um i guess that took her into a a, a a a um a level of africa that um most of the europeans didn't access mm-hmm. and by the time i was born and growing up she was already writing a fat book on um called myths and legends of southern africa and um, she'd written a bunch of other books and had been yeah active for a a good um yeah couple of decades before i was born but myths and legends was really her grand opus and as she was researching it she was um traveling around all over um southern africa not just south africa but also up to um namibia um what's now zimbabwe tanzania um mozambique um basically um interviewing the strangest people she could find Always seeking out the um, the witch doctor or the um, the storyteller and uh, and uh, harvesting this incredible body of data. Most of it now lost, what's apart from what's in the book. Um, so yeah, when I was two, three, four years old, I was um, yeah growing up in usually incredibly isolated, strange places, um, surrounded by very odd people who had um, very what, what for us are very bizarre customs. But when you're a child and you don't know any different, it seems normal. So I guess I got to, I was privileged to grow up in a very strange place, but without realizing it, I was I was mostly bored. 
um, these things would be going on and I'd be probably reading my comic book and um, ignoring the, the goat sacrifice or the, um, the herd of giraffes running by because it, 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 these things seemed normal uh, and were practically yawn-inducing. Um, which witch doctors were very entertaining when you're a child because mm-hmm. um, they're constantly pulling faces and doing tricks and doing freaky shit like putting snakes into their mouths which would then come out of their nostrils and things and which would you know, get a huge laugh out of me when I was a four or a five year old and um, yeah this very much seemed like uh, yeah kind of real life it was only when I yeah, got to um, go to school and um, when I was patched into the mi- into the, mi- the mixing board of normal human experience that I realized that um, those kind of things um, didn't exist or um, didn't really happen in the so-called real world or uh, perceived as um, evil or scary. I mean, this is a, an issue all over with the, um, with the supernatural and that for some reason everyone assumes that um, anything to do with magic or the supernatural naturally has to be terrifying, scary, or um, put one in risk of damnation in some way. But um, when you're a, a four- or five-year-old, you don't think of those things. You just think it's funny, um, entertaining. I mean, I recall seeing a, a bottle moving on the tabletop by itself when I was a kid, some kind of psychokinesis. And I recall my two older sisters, I had, I had sisters, um, were absolutely shit scared and were backing off against the wall because they were old enough to know that the bottle shouldn't move by itself. Um, I was too young to figure that, that, um, that it was dangerous or anything wrong with it. So I, was, I remember poking it and uh, uh, laughing and l- uh, looking underneath the table to see if it, there, there was a magnet or some kind of trick. Uh, but I, I don't recall ever being frightened. Uh, the the um, inherent fear of um, sorcery or, the, or supernatural only really comes, I guess, after you've been to school and you've had lots of people telling you that um, those things aren't possible or are um, somehow against um, what civilized white Christian society is, um, is meant to believe in. And um, I guess thanks to the formative experiences, I've always... Um, yeah, I had a deep liking for those kind of worlds and those kind of people. I think it's a richer world. I don't understand why people don't want to believe in anything, or uh, why um, yeah, atheism and materialism is so um, super popular, because um, it's certainly limiting. I mean, there's um, potentially any number of things out there that we have no idea about. Have you ever uh, revisited uh, that area and, and the, the witch doctors and the witchcraft and of that particular area? Not, not, not in recent years. I, I, I have gone to Haiti and, and, and to Brazil. And, um, yeah, I shot a documentary in Haiti, The White Darkness, about the voodoo. Oh, really? I don't think uh, I checked it out. Yeah, it's actually my favorite film. <laughs> I hate to say it at this late stage of the proceedings, but I think <laughs> The White Darkness may be my, my one cinematic contribution I'm proudest of. Uh-huh. Well, I, I hate to say this because uh, I didn't know that you did so many documentaries until I was looking more about you besides, you know, uh, the movies I knew did, didn't know. And I, I'm, I'm a big documentary fan, so I'm definitely going to check them out. Yeah, I might even be on YouTube, that one. Okay. Um, it's um, accessible. And if you like um, voodoo or... Um, if you like um, Ruggiero Diodato movies, because it's also very much the um, the cannibal holocaust or the, the zombie holocaust of the documentaries, mm-hmm. um, then you know, it'll slip down fine. And, um, yeah, I was in Haiti for a while and tried to um, go through the whole voodoo initiation shtick. Mm-hmm. And, um, pretty much um, just did whatever they asked me to do. And um, surrendered myself to their hands. Mm-hmm. And was treated very well by the voodoo people. So what makes that one your favorite? Uh, you think the, the finished product's the best or the whole experience of making it? I think it might be the, one of the best of the actual, cinematically it might be one of the best because um, we're just extremely lucky in terms of the, um, the equipment we had on us and the place and the time we were in. In that um, we were given top of the range, um, then um, it was like early 21st century, um, electronic news gathering equipment. There were a bunch of us, there were three of us. 
So we get multiple angles and multiple coverage of some of the live the live stuff happening, which makes the um, the editing much smoother than if you've just got one camera. And um, yeah, the sound is nicely recorded because um, we had some professional equipment. But um, also, while, while we were there shooting the voodoo, um, Haiti was invaded by the United States, um, which we weren't expecting. At the time, um, this was when Aristide was in charge in Haiti, uh, and America, who had actually set Aristide up under the Clinton regime, um, decided to, to fucking depose him. And uh, suddenly invaded the island and deposed Aristide and put their own fucking puppet leadership in charge. And we just happened to be standing there with these nice cameras with um, BBC press accreditation when it happened. So the time and the place was ideal for us to um, yeah, cover this um, this clash between the um, the US Marines and the, the voodoo people. And um, yeah, it's real. So um, yeah, happy with all that and happy with the way it's edited. It's a um, little tricky, disturbing movie that um, starts off as if it's going to be a voodoo film, but then um, yeah, makes one question the sanity and morality of the West. Uh, what were some of the, the, the weirder things you saw uh, voodoo-wise? Well, I mean, um, within voodoo itself, it's a possession-based religion. It's a syncretic religion that, like, um, Santeria and Candomblé and I'm sure a lot of medieval witchcraft here in Europe is based entirely on people being physically possessed by um, a pantheon of spirits, which they call the Loa. Uh, and there's a huge number of Loa, so there's no point trying to list them out because you get tired after listing the first 78 or so. There's a lot of them. And um, these different, which literally, yeah, possess the voodoo practitioners. And I've been no doubt from having been out there and spent a considerable amount of time around them that they are possessed, that it's not something they're just faking for camera. That what we're witnessing is a, um, a genuine um, psychotic episode. I mean, it's almost like a... Um, a mass form of um, multiple personality disorder, MPD, um, where those multiple personalities have been um, essentially linked to um, Jungian archetypes, to these archetypal god Loa figures, which can um, literally take over the bodies of the people around you. And once one person gets possessed, then the, the gates are open, and it seems suddenly six or seven or 18 people are possessed. You can see it go through a crowd like a ripple. And it's a genuine state of consciousness. Uh, um, it's not drug-induced. Uh, it, 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 it happens in a similar way to epilepsy or um, frontal lobe epilepsy. I'm sure if you wire those people up to a CAT scan, you'd be able to see a quantifiable change in their brainwave activity when it happened. Um, it, it can be induced through the voodoo ritual. They can put people into that state and take them out of it. So um, on that level, it, it's, it's certainly something very fascinating, whether you believe it's um, supernatural or not. They, um, voodoo definitely works. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, what were the, um, the craziest things I saw, there was so much fucking crazy shit going on. Um, to um, pull out an example, um, at one point, the drummer was taking me around the graveyard in Port-au-Prince, introducing me to the important people in the graveyard. And there was this old dude who only spoke Creole, um, um, who was super important, and I had to meet him and shake his hand, etc., etc. And um, I, as, I was to, as the drummer was talking to him, I noticed the old dude had a fucking horn that was growing out of his head. It was, it was a bony extrusion that had grown out of his forehead and had grown through his flesh, and he had one horn. Um, which um, kind of freaked me out. And, um, I said this to the translator when I got back from the graveyard. I said, wow, man, Frisner showed me this dude. He had a, a fucking horn coming out of his head. And the translator looked at me and said, that's nothing. Next time I will take you to Sucre. There you will find a guy with three horns and three eyes. Have you ever seen anything like that? And, yeah, I guess things like that were sort of Dr. Seuss freaky. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> did, uh, did he take you there to see the three eyed? No, 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 he didn't. But it was just, it seemed normal. Yeah. Um, that's nothing. I show you a guy with three hordes. <laughs> 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 but yeah, Haiti was full of just weird shit, oh. which um, I adored. <clears throat> I mean, the um, closest to zombies um, 
me and the camera guy were Mr. Horn, my German cameraman friend, were coming back along through some rice paddies at sunset in um, Sucre, and um, we're walking along this path between the paddies. Um, there was a guy trying to uh, coming the other way down the path. We couldn't get out of his way because there were rice paddies on either side. Uh, he was obviously insane and trying to escape, and was running on all fours like a dog. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, we, we immediately moved to get our cameras to uh, to, to start filming. Um, it was one of the only times when the voodoo people said, no, we can't film, uh, and um, stopped us from drawing our cameras. And then the people who were chasing the guy who was trying to escape on all fours caught up with him, and they grabbed him and they took him back. And I don't know what the hell he was escaping from. Uh, I don't know what the hell was wrong with him. Um, except we weren't allowed to shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, but Haiti was full of that kind of stuff. I loved it. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, what was, I mean, you've been to a lot of places. What would you say is the most interesting place? Yeah, h- h- hard to say. I mean, you know, it's, I couldn't grade him that way, but uh, Haiti was like being in the Dr. Seuss story. I mean, I felt I felt like I was plunged into the cat in the hat, or um, it was just it was wonderfully insane. And, um, yeah, very, very, very flamboyant. Um, nowadays, I'm living in the south of France because there's not a war going on here at the moment. Mm-hmm. I mean, the problem with most of the most extraordinary places in the world is there's inevitably some kind of war happening, or they become um, too dangerous for folk to go. Mm-hmm. I mean, even Haiti, you don't see a lot of a lot of tourists. And um, Africa and Afghanistan and places, there's some distinct problems for um, yeah, being a Western tourist. So I've ended up um, making my home here in the Pyrenees because Western Europe's kind of um, tranquil and there's less chance of um, having folk wanting to shoot me just for being here. And, and this place is super strange and, um, yeah, tourist friendly. Very cool. Uh, I really appreciate you coming in and talking to me tonight. It's been awesome. Oh, man, it's been a pleasure. I hope you can make something out of it.